A massive shout out to the John and Tier member Mr. Leroy1998 and Jen and Tier Leah Rav. Your support means a lot. If you would like your name mentioned in every video, support the channel, as well as receive special perks and soon having early access to new series, consider becoming a member of this channel by hitting that join button. Hi guys, this is the next part of, what if Naruto had the most powerful ice Zanpakuto Hirenmaru. I hope you enjoy. To be a traitor, Itachi said calmly, his eyes narrowing slightly, I would first have to have been loyal to Akatsuki. Beneath his mask, Kakuzu's face twisted into an angry snarl, you, in his shock, Shikamaru's concentration wavered, something that Hidan noticed as he cried, he released the technique. Katetsu, Asuma shouted, brandishing his trench knives defensively, Azumo. Fall back, Kakuzu's gaze moved, his eyes widening slightly as he caught sight of the sash hanging from the Jonin's waist. Murmuring to himself, he said, so that one in the center really is, he glanced over at his partner, I see the lure of money's got you for once, Hidan. Kakuzu, you handle Itachi, Hidan said, gripping his scythe tightly as a maniacal grin crossed his lips. I'm going to use these other four for my ceremony. The money is all yours. Works for me, Kakuzu said nonchalantly. Just don't underestimate them, you'll get yourself killed, like they could pull it off, Hidan scoffed arrogantly. He began drawing a symbol on the ground in his own blood. If they could kill me, I'd let them. The design, a circle with a triangle inside of it, was finished, and Hidan's voice had a menacing edge to it, but that's not happening, is it? What's he going to do with that diagram? Shikamaru whispered, brow furrowed in frustration. Be careful, came Itachi's smooth warning. After he obtains a sample of your blood, any damage he does to himself while inside that circle will be done to you. Ah, you ruin all the fun. Hidan whined childishly. I'll take the lead. Asuma muttered, eyes narrowed. Shikamaru, when you see an opening, stop him with your shadow sewing. If you can keep him occupied long enough, I'll lop off his head and hopefully stop him from interfering further. That's too risky, Shikamaru hissed. This isn't like you. It's the best strategy we've got right now, Asuma said solemnly. Hidan pulled the long, thick weapons out of his body, then swung his side into the dirt. This guy's a hell of a lot stronger than me. There was a pause, then, at some unheard signal, the battle began. Asuma leapt forward, trench knives alight with deadly chakra. Hidan met his charge and attacked with one of the stolen weapons. It shattered upon impact with the knives, and Shikamaru's shadow dove forward in tendrils, seeking to latch onto Hidan. The silver-haired man, however, would not be caught, and jumped upward, launching his scythe toward his foe. Asuma dodged slightly out of the way and the three blades dug into the dirt. Hidan pulled the second stolen weapon out and zipped forward along the cord of his weapon. Like its predecessor, the second stolen sword was destroyed easily. Hidan landed on his feet, tossing a smirk back at Asuma, you've got some nice knives. So, Itachi, Kukuzu started conversationally, are we going to fight, or just stand here? I'm waiting for my backup, Itachi said calmly. Backup, Kukuzu asked disbelievingly, yes, Itachi replied, still a cool as if he were talking about the weather. He's blonde, about Asuma's height, with bright blue eyes. Couldn't miss him, Kakuzu let out a harsh laugh, the great Uchiha Itachi needs backup. Not really, Itachi said nonchalantly, not if I don't care about my teammates, anyway. But, you see, Asuma-san and his team are precious to me. Were I to fight now with no concern for their safety, they would most assuredly die. Compassion makes you weak, Kakuzu growled. Not really, Itachi replied coolly. Without warning, his right hand whipped out, tossing three kanai in the direction of the other battle and knocking Hidan's scythe away from Shikamaru. One of the three blades fell off, sliced away from the hole. Red Sharingan eyes turned back to face their opponent's teal, the owner's lips forming syllables, one word, Kakuzu-san, boom. Kakuzu had time to slam his hands together as his eyes widened and say just one word in response, shit. The Itachi standing near Kakuzu exploded in a violent gush of chakra, kicking up a large cloud of smoke that obscured the results. A dark figure flew out of the haze, skin dark and undamaged, but his cloak sleeves and upper front nearly disintegrated. Stitches covered him all over, dominating the visible portions of his flesh. Another Itachi appeared from nowhere, standing right behind his former ally. Pushing a single finger forward, Itachi leaned down and whispered in Kakuzu's ear, that's one. 
The fingers sunk through Kakuzu's flesh as if it were liquid, letting out a violent spray of blood. Kakuzu collapsed forward, for all appearances, dead. Itachi looked at his bloody finger calmly, murmuring to himself, four more to go. This isn't looking good, Asuma muttered, scowling. Itachi can handle that other guy, but if things get too serious, we'll all be caught in the crossfire. Then we just take out this guy, Kotetsu said reasonably, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Easier said than done, Shikamaru whispered gravely. He's moving too quickly for us to hit him, let alone trap him. To attempt anything particularly ambitious would be tantamount to suicide. Shikamaru's right, Asuma admitted. If we weren't here, Itachi could probably wipe the floor with these guys. As long as we are, Itachi can't pull out his best stuff without worrying about us getting caught in the middle. But if we try to run, it's the same thing. Fighting at his current level, holding back as much as he is, Itachi wouldn't be able to buy us enough time to run away without pulling out all the stops. It'd be a moot point. Three years ago, I never thought I'd say this, but, Shikamaru murmured, brow furrowed, we need Naruto. I know he's good, Azumo said, but what difference could Naruto make? A lot, Asuma said bitterly. Shikamaru's right. We need someone who has experience fighting guys like these. We need someone on their level. We need Naruto. I suppose, a familiar voice chimed in, if you need me that badly, I could lend you a hand. A tall figure appeared in front of them, his white cloak billowing around him and the flames printed onto the bottom seeming to move in the wind. His blonde hair was free and spiky, uninhibited by the hit I ate tied around his right biceps, and, printed on the back of his cloak were the words, Konoha no Ryajin, obscured only by a green sash and a black sheath. Naruto tossed a smirk over his shoulder, but you owe me one. He unsheathed his sword, shouting, Oi, Itachi! Want to switch? The dark-haired Uchiha glanced in his direction, shrugged and replied with, Why not? In a blur, the two of them had traded places and Itachi stood in front of Asuma and his group, speaking to them calmly, Asuma-san, Kotetsu-san, Azumo-san, Shikamaru-san, please find cover. Blonde hair, blue eyes, whisker marks on the cheeks, Kakuzu grinned as he stood, shedding his cloak, you must be the QB Jinchuriki. Your head is worth even more than that other guy's. I like my head where it is, thanks, Naruto said coolly, lifting his sword up. The sky darkened and water swirled up from the blade's hilt, twisting around the sharpened steel like twin snakes. A downward slash released a gigantic dragon that wound forward. Kakuzu raised his hands in a seal again, his skin turning dark, but it proved meaningless as the beast swerved away from him. Instead, it struck Hidan's legs, washing over him as he swore up a storm and tried to lift himself out of the water, damn it. What the hell, as the torrent subsided, the sodden clothes Hidan was wearing started to ice over and the wet ground became slick and hard. Kakuzu's brow knitted together as he scrutinized the scene, then turned his inhuman eyes back on the blonde teen grinning at him. In a soft growl, he spoke, your target was never me. You washed away Hidan's circle. I guess you're the brains out of the two of you. Naruto said calmly, hair and cloak fluttering in a sudden breeze. He jerked toward the left, taking a step back with that foot and holding his sword next to his hip as if he were about to draw it from a scabbard. Kakuzu raised an eyebrow at this, but merely settled down, prepared to guard against this new threat. The sword slashed in a horizontal arc, sending a thin curve of light shooting forwards at astounding speeds. Kakuzu activated his armor defense and held his arms up in a block. The arc crashed against his skin violently, but was cold and freezing instead of sharp and stabbing. He felt it try to cut through him, but it could not. It was water. The rest of the beam dug into the ground behind him, cutting gouges into the soft soil. On his arms, and from these new trenches in the earth, ice grew, spiking up behind him and frosting over on his skin. He flexed his arms and the thin layer of frozen liquid shattered like delicate glass. The sky was still dark and both fighters' breaths came out in little clouds and streams of steam, before dissolving into the air. Naruto's eyes, bright and vibrant, seemed to glow with some hidden power as he reached up and unzipped his vest down to his collarbone. With a little nudging, a luminescent red orb, no bigger than his thumbnail and perfectly spherical, popped out, hanging from a strong-looking black thread by way of a dragon's claw made of pure silver. That looks valuable, Kukuzu remarked greedily. He eyed it with a hunger that looked like it would strain his sight. It is, Naruto smirked, leaving the pendant to hang innocently, 
but you'll never get the chance to learn why. Kakuzu didn't respond, merely grunting as four creatures detached from his back, standing up as hulking black masses with grotesque masks as their only real identifier. Immediately, one of them melted into a pile of goop. Kakuzu didn't seem bothered or surprised by this fact, so Naruto revised what Itachi had told him and Jiraiya about his opponent. Kakuzu was incredibly greedy to a fault, often putting money above the objective of his mission. He had five hearts, four of which turned into these masked creatures and were extremely dangerous. The fifth heart stayed in Kakuzu's body, sustaining him. Therefore, one needed to take out all five hearts to kill Kakuzu. Naruto's smirk widened a bit, and Itachi seemed to have taken care of one of them already, leaving four more to be destroyed. Orochimaru didn't exaggerate your powers, Kakuzu said in his raspy voice. The remaining three creatures tensed behind him in preparation. Your hit I ate, though, reminds me of the first Konoha ninja I fought. The first Hokage, I mean. A slight widening of his eyes was all that gave away Naruto's surprise, you fought the first. Kakuzu snorted, are we here to fight, or not? Naruto grinned, right, a swing of his sword summoned a colossal water dragon that immediately sought out Kakuzu. The man merely stood still, but one of his beasts took over. A ball of fire gathered in front of its open mouth, and was then launched forward like a bullet. It collided with its liquid adversary, exploding upon contact. The dragon would not be defeated so easily, however, and swallowed the ball of flames before it detonated. Water sprayed everywhere and steam rose in thick clouds from the point of impact, obscuring Kakuzu's widened eyes as he realized that his technique had been halted by mere water. A rushing sound was all the warning he got before a second dragon came barreling through the mist, red eyes gleaming maliciously. Kakuzu leapt over top of it, watching as it consumed his lightning mask. He almost let the relief wash over him, it could be salvaged as long as it was intact. It was dashed nearly as quickly. Naruto appeared in front of the frozen mask beast, sword sinking into the ice as if it were butter. Kakuzu could only watch in horror and rage as the ice was cracked by a thin knife of the same substance and his beast's head was split nearly in half. Turning around, the blonde unleashed another serpentine monster at him, sending the blue beast soaring upwards effortlessly. Kakuzu silently commanded his fire mask to unleash another blast to destroy the water dragon and moved his hands into a seal. The instant the small ball of flame was released, Kakuzu's skin turned a dark brown and hardened. There was another explosion of water and superheated steam as the fire clashed with the dragon. Kakuzu, however, was unharmed as he landed safely on the ground, the earth around his feet forming slight craters as his hardened and denser body came to a halt. He looked up at the boy with a glare that could kill a genin. Two down, Naruto taunted lightly in a sing-song voice. He received no warning before the fire and wing masked beasts launched a combined assault on him. The resulting explosion and flames quickly engulfed him and he disappeared within their depths. A deep sense of satisfaction welled up inside of Kakuzu, bringing a smile that stretched across his face beneath his mask. The sound of steel cutting through flesh and fabric reached his ears and he turned around as quick as he could, his neck cracking loudly at the speed. The blonde boy stood up from his kneeling position, flicking the blood off his blade with a sharp swipe to the side. His left hand jerked up, a tri-pronged kunai spinning on his middle finger for but a moment before he holstered it again on his left thigh. Belatedly, Kakuzu noticed that, though he was right-handed, his kunai and shuriken holster was strapped to his left leg. You, Kakuzu growled, staring at the remains of his wind mask. It's a very useful technique, Naruto stated neutrally, his face set in stone. Fast, untraceable, incapable of being copied, and it uses no chakra whatsoever. Another kunai seemed to leap into his left hand and was promptly thrown into the dirt. He closed his eyes and let out a breath, I can tell where everyone within 20 meters of this kunai is standing. As long as it has a pulse or has a significant amount of chakra, I can find it. Glowing blue eyes snapped open, I'm very lucky I know the technique, or else I would very likely have been torn to shreds by that last jutsu of yours. I'd recognize that anywhere, Kakuzu grumbled irritably, eyes narrowing. Where did you learn the Horishin no Jutsu? Naruto smirked lightly, you seem to be forgetting that my father is its creator. Did you really think it impossible for me to know his most powerful technique? Whatever, Kakuzu drawled in his raspy voice. He silently recalled his last beast. I know when I'm outmatched. You got the element of surprise on me, kid, or else I would have beaten you into a bloody, 
As his final mask moved to rejoin his body, it was intercepted by the blonde teen. With a sickening squelch and a sharp ring, the fire mask was bisected down the middle by the silvery blade of Hyo Rin Maru. Immediately, Kakuzu's rage sprung to the surface again and he began shifting into his most powerful form as he let out a roar. He never got the chance. Faster than he could track, Naruto's sword had sailed forward and sunk into his chest and through his heart. His final heart, with a gasp, he started to stumble backwards, desperately trying to gather air in his lungs as his vision began to fade. His bare back collided with the soft, wet ground, driving the oxygen from his chest. His final sight was a shining gleam as the blonde slashed at him and detached his head. Rolling his shoulders back, Naruto let out a sigh, his eyes closed. He paused a moment, then frowned. Muttering to himself, he said, two more, huh. He dan over there and, that, plant guy over in the trees. He reached up and tugged at the gem around his neck. It came free rather easily and he held it up, as if examining it, guess it's your time to shine. Clenching it in his fist, he shouted, Itachi, Minasan, out of the way. Alarmed, Itachi and Asuma's team dodged out of the way, just in time to avoid being swallowed up by a dragon of icy water. Hidan wasn't so lucky and took the full brunt of the attack, suddenly finding himself frozen in place and unable to move. He struggled, but it was pointless. He was immobilized from the neck down, damn it. Get as far away from here as you can, Naruto warned his comrades. He held up the gem, which began to glow, Kimi no na wo yobu, I call your name, Itachi's eyes widened into saucers as he saw the gem begin to glow. Turning to his comrades, he hissed, in a tone that brooked no argument, run. Immediately, the group of five fled the scene, dashing off into the woods at blinding speeds. As soon as he felt they were far enough away, the blonde let out a sigh and finished his sentence, Hyo Rin Maru. There was a bright light and an intense feeling of vertigo as he shot up into the air like a bullet, his feet pressed against hard blue scales and his nose tickled by the cool wind. He opened his eyes and found himself standing atop the crowned head of Hyo Rin Maru, the ground several meters below him. It works, he breathed. That old pervert actually made this thing right. Indeed he did, came the answer, but it wasn't spoken aloud. Naruto took in and let out a deep breath, this summoning gem of his actually works. So this is what he needed my blood for. He reached up and replaced the gem. It seemed to zoom out of his fingers and into the three toes of the silver dragon claw, attached snugly. He looked down at the ground below, at the odd and motionless Hidan and felt the two enemy signatures within range. Itachi and the others were long gone. There are two of them, Naruto said calmly, talking to the dragon. We need to scatter them to the winds. Then, Hyo Rin Maru started out slowly, we're going to use it. Yes, Naruto replied. Akito modified to such a level and with such destructive potential that only one name really suits it, Mega Flare. With a grunt that sounded more like a growl, Hyo Rin Maru spread his large, feathery wings and shot up into the sky. Naruto glued himself to the beast's scales with his chakra, kneeling down as the large creature performed various aerial stunts to place himself at an optimal angle for his attack. Once that angle had been found, the dragon stopped in midair, bobbing up and down slightly as he flapped his great wings. His mouth opened, revealing two opposing rows of dangerously sharp teeth. Between his jaws, an azure blue orb began to form, growing slightly larger with each passing moment. Finally, as it began to grow too large to contain, the great beast leaned his head back, Naruto holding onto his spiked crown as his feet glued him to his scales. With a sudden jerk, the dragon's head shot forward, as if he were spitting something out. The ball of energy leapt from his mouth, shooting downwards at blinding speeds. The collision with the ground was a sight to see, as the blue orb pulsed upon impact, but the explosion that resulted was even more magnificent. The azure ball grew in size, quickly consuming the entirety of the bounty station and most of the surrounding area, casting a pale blue glow on the untouched trees and all that was spared its wrath. Then, in a flash of white light, it vanished. A crater was left behind, however, one that was several meters deep and nearly twice as wide. Pulling out a tri-prong kunai, he tossed it into the crater and closed his eyes, waiting for it to land. When it did, a couple seconds later, he let out a sigh. He could sense no one, no presence within the range of the kunai. Good job, Hyo Rin Maru, Naruto said calmly. With a nod, the beast began to fade away. Naruto leapt off of his head, 
Doing a flip in midair as the dragon vanished in a flash of blue. He too vanished in a flash, this time of yellow, and appeared next to the kanai he had thrown, landing effortlessly. Didera, Sasori, Kisame, Hidan, Kakuzu, and Zetsu, the blonde recited as he picked up his kanai. He looked at it, frowning thoughtfully. That leaves Conan, Toby, and Pain. Naruto's glowing blue eyes gleamed fiercely. An orange-haired man looked up at his partner, both his and her features hazy in the dark tower. Clouds hung in the sky outside, blanketing the entire village in darkness. Blue eyes, inside of which were several thin rings that surrounded his pupils, seemed almost to glow in the dark. He's late, the orange-haired man said calmly. His partner didn't respond. Zetsu is never late, should we assume the worst, then, the blue-haired maiden asked in a soft, melodic voice. It was easy to see why the villagers called her an angel, if the voice hadn't already given it away. She was easily a very beautiful woman, with delicate features unmarred by war and famine and luminescent eyes. We cannot be sure what has detained him, the orange-haired man said, turning his gaze towards the dark shadows that surrounded them. A small frown pulled at his lips, his eyes narrowing slightly. Zetsu is not one to engage in combat, the woman remarked calmly. She didn't seem overly concerned with the supposed fate of her comrade, and neither did the man across from her. It seemed almost as if they were discussing the abysmal weather outside, rather than whether or not someone had died. True, the man replied, but it is not entirely impossible that Hidan and Kakuzu got into another fight that is simply lasting longer than expected. After all, that's what Zetsu does, isn't it? He's our, look out, how nice, she said stoically, it sounds almost as if you care. He glared at her, her lips quirking into a small smile. With a flash of sudden lightning, however, it was gone, almost as if it had never been there. The man scoffed, turning his gaze back to the shadows of the room as rain pounded against the walls and ceiling. Things are progressing smoothly, the man said, changing the subject. With our recent sealing of the two tails and Toba's capture and delivery of the three tails, it won't be long before our plans come to fruition. And then, the world will be at peace, the woman said softly. Yes, the man acknowledged. But, before that, we'll have to take care of Madara. We cannot allow him to influence the outcome or else everything could fall apart. As long as he is a factor, we cannot ignore his inevitable clash with us. You're right, Conan said calmly, but he may not be our fiercest opponent in all of this. Pain glanced in her direction, you speak of the Namikaze boy, the container of the fearsome nine-tailed fox. Not only he, Conan said warily, but Jiraiya-sama as well. I fear you are right, Pain admitted. Alone, perhaps we could defeat them. But should they fight together, then one of us could never be enough to have any chance of victory. Conan looked at him, then let us pray that day never comes. The sun shined brightly, hanging high in the midday sky as it bathed the people beneath it in warmth and light. The streets were bustling with activity, citizens and ninja alike going about their daily business. Vendors called out to passers-by, offering their products in a way that might appeal to the average person. Carved into the front of a large, long mountain, the faces of the five Hokage stared out over the village, watching its inhabitants stonily and casting a solemn gaze over those they had sworn to protect in life. Each wore a stern expression and, despite the large crack in the Sandime's chiseled features, none of the firmness of their faces was lost to age or wear. Two people sat out in this sun, their faces and upper bodies protected by the banners of an outdoor restaurant with the words, Ichiraku Ramen, spelled out on the outside. One was a girl, sitting on the right side of a boy with spiky blonde hair, the one who was doing the actually talking. He was reading from a sheet that was written in his untidy scrawl. When the War of the Beasts brings about the world's end, Naruto read, the goddess descends from the sky, wings of light and dark spread afar. She guides us to bliss, her gift, everlasting. Wow, Hinata whispered, watching him as he smiled and held up a finger. Infinite in mystery is the gift of the goddess, he continued, reading from a different sheet. We seek it thus, and take to the sky. Ripples form on the water's surface, the wandering soul knows no rest. Loveless, Act 1, a voice said. The pair turned around, watching as Jiraiya smiled at them and sat down next to Hinata. He cast a glance over at Naruto, shaking his head lightly. Naruto smiled, setting the piece of paper down as his mentor ordered a chicken ramen from the shop owner, Tuki. You remembered, he remarked, 
folding the papers up and sticking them inside his kanai pouch. How can I not? Jiraiya thumped his middle and index finger up against the side of his skull, when you've beaten it into my head. You are the one who told me to write my own books if I thought yours weren't any good, Naruto pointed out, smirking lightly. I suppose I was, Jiraiya conceded. He ate some of his ramen, turning to his godson as he swallowed. So, how far have you come along with that piece of yours? I'm working on Act 2, Naruto told him. There are a few bits of it that I'm not all that confident of, so it's a slow process, but still quite satisfying. Here, he pulled out a sheet of paper, reciting, There is no hate, only joy, for you are beloved by the goddess, hero of the dawn, healer of worlds, he trailed off, I'm stuck here. I can't decide what to put next. Jiraiya chewed on more of his ramen, then was struck by an idea, gesturing for Naruto to give him the paper. As he did, the older man grabbed the nearest writing utensil and scribbled a few words down, then handed the piece of paper back to the blonde, who read it aloud eagerly. Dreams of the morrow hath the shattered soul, he echoed the words on the paper. He scribbled more beneath that line, adding in his own bits now that Jiraiya had started him off. Pride is lost, wings stripped away, the end, is nigh. Wow, Hinata said as Naruto put the paper away, eyes wide. Where did you guys learn to write like that? I don't know where he learned it, Naruto said, finally turning to eat his own ramen. Through a mouthful of food, he continued, but I learned it from him. That's such a good story, Naruto-kun, Hinata said softly, waiting for her food to cool a little bit before she ate. It's starting to get a little dark, but the emotion, the feeling, it's so intense. I can't wait until it's finished, she added as she dug into her meal. That one's so good, they'll probably still be reading it a thousand years from now. Naruto swallowed, looking at her eagerly, do you really think so? MMHM, Hinata answered. You really have some talent, Naruto-kun. I'm sorry to ruin this little outing, Jiraiya said, suddenly deathly serious. His ramen was completely gone, but, Naruto, you and I have a mission we're going on. Naruto nodded as he finished eating, all right. What should I pack? Nothing, Jiraiya told him. For this mission, we need to be as inconspicuous as possible. You have 30 minutes, meet me at the north gate. Without another word, he stood and left. Tsunade keeled over and gave a great lurch, emptying the contents of her stomach onto the ground. After a couple seconds of retching, she paused and panted for breath. Then, her back arched again and she tried, in vain, to stop the bile from rising up the back of her throat. She was unsuccessful. The process went like this for a few moments as the alcohol was purged from her body, landing on the ground with a splash and mixed with her stomach acid. Finally, as her body finished, she stood shakily, still panting as if she had run a marathon. Her drinking partner helped steady her. Geez, Jiraiya said, holding onto her as she tried to regain her footing. She still swayed a little, you're even worse with sake than I am. Let's take a break, somehow. The two of them managed to cross the whole village without knocking into anything or tripping and found themselves leaning back against a bench under the bright sunlight. Jiraiya had one hand atop the scroll that he always carried, the other on his knee as he tried to keep himself steady. You're dealing with someone who's strong enough to keep Akatsuki in line, Tsunade said seriously, no sign of a slur in her voice. We have no idea what his power is or how strong he is, and you and Naruto are just going to waltz right into his turf, just like that. You have to be drunk. Yeah, Jiraiya looked about to stand, I guess I should get going, then. Come back alive, Tsunade said suddenly. She looked down at her hands, tears welling up in the corners of her eyes. If I lose you too, I, are you going to cry for me? Jiraiya laughed drunkenly, I'm honored, I don't suppose I'll get as many tears as Dan did, though. Asshole, Tsunade muttered angrily. All right, how about we put your gambling skills to use, Jiraiya suggested. You always pick the losing bet. Put everything you have on me dying, and, in return, I'll come back alive and well. What? Tsunade asked quietly, appalled. Ha ha, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Jiraiya laughed again, I'm very grateful to you, you know. Getting dumped always makes a man stronger. And if he hasn't experienced it enough to laugh about it or use it as material, he can't fulfill his duties as a man. So it's the man's responsibility to be strong, eh? Tsunade asked amusedly. Pretty much, Jiraiya confirmed. But, then again, men aren't meant to pursue happiness. Bah, 
Tsunade said, a laugh in her voice, you men are all alike. Without women around, there'd be no one to reject your advances and toughen you up. Very true, Jiraiya chuckled. Send one of your toads if you get in a tight spot you can't escape from, Tsunade said seriously. I'll come and back you up immediately. I don't think so, Jiraiya remarked. No matter what, you absolutely have to remain in the village. This place relies on you to keep it together. There are plenty of other worthy candidates for Hokage, she said, looking down. Jiraiya, who had stood up earlier, said, how are people supposed to be comfortable living here if their leader keeps changing? You're the best person for the job in the village and that's that. We've got Kakashi, she said, and Naruto, eventually. Kakashi's a given, he argued, but Naruto still has a little more improving to do before he's ready, even if you did see fit to give him your necklace. You're one to talk, she remarked, you crammed him full of power. You even taught him the Rasengan. Yeah, and maybe I shouldn't have, he grinned. It felt like I was teaching Minato again. Namikaze Minato, she mumbled, the resemblance is uncanny. Minato had talent you only see once a decade, at best, he laughed mirthlessly. No one like him has been born in a while, besides Naruto, anyways. He was such a nice kid, but his guts and his desire to succeed were the fiercest I've ever seen. And, in the blink of an eye, he was fourth Hokage. I never had kids, so I wouldn't know, but, if he was my son, I'd be bragging all the time. Hearing you say that, Tsunade commented, makes me think of how different they are, too. I mean, he has a lot in common with his father besides his looks, but he's definitely got quite a bit of his mother in him, too. It'd be hard if you made me choose which one he's more like. A female ninja of the former Uzumaki no Kuni, Jiraiya said lightly, searching for her name. His personality and ninjutsu style, Tsunade began, are very similar to Uzumaki Kushina's. That was her name, Jiraiya exclaimed, snapping his fingers. I remember, with that red hair, the constant jabbering, and that tomboyish demeanor, she was just like one of the boys. Kushina became so beautiful as she grew up, she said, but Naruto does look remarkably like his father. That's why I see him in Naruto, he insisted. I have to admit, I've come to think of him as my own grandson. He picked up his scroll, okay, so I'll be off. A thought struck him, oh, and one last bit of advice. Be careful of Root, I know, she assured him. Jiraiya laughed, that's a relief. As he left, Tsunade couldn't shake the dark feeling that this would be the last time she saw him. In the hidden rain village, the weather was much as it usually was, raining. The sky was dark and overcast, puffy clouds indistinguishable from one another as they let loose a torrential downpour that would have soaked the inhabitants were it not for the protective gear they all wore. Tall buildings reached towards the heavens above, but none were nearly as tall as the one building that mattered most, the building where the leader of the village resided, atop a tall tower with impressive architecture. Most did not often meet with this man, much less see his face and know his true name. They simply called him God. The only one who had any contact with this man they treated as a deity was his right hand, the one referred to only as, God's angel. All knew her face, and all knew that she was a beauty unlike any other in any other village. Two figures stepped from their boat, both wearing coats to protect against the weather with the hoods up to disguise their appearances. They walked down the streets, wandering through the many roads and taking in the buildings surrounding them as they went. No one paid them any mind, despite that they looked slightly out of place. Atop a tower, a man stood out in the rain, his cloak hiding his body and his orange hair defying both the water and the forces of gravity. To the woman behind him, he spoke, Conan, when I stop the rain, use your jutsu to find these intruders. I'll take care of it, she responded calmly. He flashed through hand seals, saying, as he stopped on the last one, here I go. Understood, she said, eyes half-lidded as she put her hands in a seal. Welcome, the white-haired bartender cried jovially as two rain nin walked into his bar. Off to the side, the blonde-haired waiter rolled his eyes. It's just the two of us, the bearded one said as he took off his hat. So bring us some drinks and side dishes, the scarred one said. As they sat down, he turned to his companion. Isn't today Sunday? I heard Pain Sama had some stuff to do, the bearded one said. These days, he might have to go to other countries. But to have it rain off schedule, the scarred one muttered, this has never happened before. It must be quite a mission, then, the bearded one said. 
But if it goes on like this, the scarred one whined. Hey! The bearded one exclaimed angrily. Pain Sama has done quite a lot for the people of the streets. Just bear with it for a bit. Sorry to keep you gentlemen waiting, the bartender smiled, clasping his hands together. Hey, where's our food and drinks? The scarred one asked. Since it's our grand opening today, we have some special services, the bartender said. He moved his hand into a hand seal. The two of you sure are lucky today. In a puff of smoke, he was replaced with a white-haired ninja. As the two rain nin scrambled away, the ninja leapt onto the counter, grinning at them. The bearded one yelled, You, who the hell are you? I'm the one who's going to do the asking around here, Jiraiya said playfully. And I've got lots of questions. The walls around them morphed from wood and plaster into flesh and blood, the door disappearing completely. Before they could react, the soft, cushy walls had engulfed their hands and feet, trapping them. The blonde waiter, now dressed eerily similar to the fourth Hokage, was sitting on the fleshy floor, waiting. From your seemingly low standards and mannerisms, Jiraiya said, I'd guess you're the bottommost of the cannon fodder, right? Where the hell are we? The bearded one demanded. Inside the belly of my frog, Jiraiya stated plainly, as if he were speaking of the weather. You, you're that senin, the bearded one shouted. And that waiter, he's the Ryujin, isn't he? I thought I told you that I'm the one doing the questioning here, Jiraiya pulled out a soft black feather. Naruto winced lightly, rubbing at the back of his right shoulder, didn't I? What are you going to do with that feather? The scarred one asked warily, eyeing it nervously. It's for tickling, Jiraiya said excitedly, if you don't want to get tickled to death, you better answer my questions like a good boy. Now, about your leader, Pain, the blonde teen stood up, walking forward, I've got a better idea. He leaned over the bearded one, closing his eyes halfway and propping himself up with his right arm. He leveled his strongest glare at the man, the atmosphere around him growing heavy and thick with malice as the air was driven from the ninja's lungs. In the darkest growl he could manage, he said, talk. Stuttering nervously the man cried out, Pain Sama resides within the tallest of the western towers. As Naruto backed away, the scarred man asked, are you, with the rebel Omegaker faction? Rebel. Jiraiya asked, blinking, I thought this country was in civil war. I'm not surprised, considering how isolationistic this country is, the bearded man smirked. The civil war is over, and we won. Pain Sama, he destroyed the former Omegaker single-handedly. Impossible, Jiraiya muttered, frowning. Naruto glanced at him. No matter how strong this, Pain is, Omegaker's leader, Hanzo the Salamander, is renowned to the point that every shinobi everywhere will recognize his name. That's right, the bearded man said. Hanzo was not only very powerful, he was also highly cautious. Approaching his side is a feat in and of itself. Guards were stationed in 24-hour rotations and even children were searched before being allowed to see him. And how was Hanzo killed? Jiraiya asked, face set in stone. That's just it, the bearded one laughed, we don't know. Jiraiya let out a sigh, I can't believe it, Hanzo, defeated. By one man. This is a god we're talking about, the bearded one giggled insanely, his jutsu are quite fearsome. But the true horror, the true horror of Pain Sama lies in his heart of steel. Those who might threaten his ideals are crushed mercilessly. Men, women, children, it didn't matter. If they knew Hanzo, they were exterminated. It was judgment, a grin grew on his face, exactly like that of a god. Pain raised his hands to the sky and the rain suddenly stopped, though dark clouds still rumbled far overhead. Without turning, he commanded, do it now, Conan. Yes, she replied, hands still in a seal. Her body peeled apart into countless pieces of paper, scattering to the winds and shaping themselves into thousands of little butterflies that fluttered outwards, searching for the ones who dared disturb the peace and harmony of the hidden rain village. As a frog surfaced from the river, it opened its mouth wide. From inside its belly, two figures pulled themselves free. The first was the bearded man, who turned around to address the frog as the scarred man picked saliva off of his clothing, scowling, hurry back to the leaf village. Find Ibiki, he'll know how to handle that guy. That's disgusting, you know, the scarred man said, lip curling in a sneer as the frog disappeared. Shush, the bearded man said. To himself, he muttered, I really hope they fall for this. He laid a hand against one of the pillars, walking forward with his partner and trying to act like he fit in. Neither of them noticed the paper butterfly as it fluttered on by, 
vanishing behind one of the corners and slowly forming into a beautiful woman with dark blue hair and an origami rose tucked above her right ear. Standing atop a tower, an orange-haired figure looked out over the city. Behind him, sheets of paper formed into a woman, who said, It's Jiraiya, Jiraiya-sensei. The orange-haired man asked, his long hair pulled into a ponytail. That takes me back, and Naruto, Conan finished. Pain was silent, so she ventured. What do we do, Pain? Kill them, obviously, Pain said stoically, and take the nine tails from the boy. I hold no love for our old sensei, and I did bring this body out to kill an intruder. Tell me where he is. As you wish, a piece of paper broke off from her body and folded into a paper airplane, gliding in his direction. Her body started to fall back apart. I'll hold them off until you get there. Don't mind me, Pain said. If you can handle it on your own, do it. Jiraiya and Naruto, disguised as the ninja they had captured, looked up as thousands of sheets of paper fluttered down from the sky, taking on a life of their own. As one, they managed to say, what the, before it wrapped around them and trapped them in a prison with only their eyes free. In front of Jiraiya, a woman formed, holding a spear made out of paper. As she poised it for his heart, however, and made to strike, the real Jiraiya rose from the shadow his full body cast had made, taking a deep breath. He blew out, releasing a ball of fire, Kaden, Enden. Fireball, as the paper caught fire, the cast that contained Naruto collapsed inwards and released a puff of smoke. All it had trapped was a cage bunshin. The woman frowned thoughtfully, staring at the white-haired man emotionlessly, that can only be your toad silhouette technique. I always thought you were dead, Jiraiya remarked as he stood, Naruto appearing next to him with his sword drawn. But, all this time, you were just a bunch of paper scattered to the winds, eh, Conan? Why you're, the bearded man stuttered as he stumbled away, God's angel. Now you're an angel, Jiraiya teased, a messenger of God, as it were. Leave now, she said to the bearded man, ignoring the other two. With an anxious nod, the man leapt away frightfully. Naruto turned to Jiraiya, who is she, sensei? An old student of mine, Jiraiya muttered. He raised his voice, asking Conan, who or what is pain? You don't need to know, sensei, she said calmly. She cast a glance at the blonde boy. You seem to have forgotten about us anyway. A pair of angelic wings formed on her back, composed of paper, and lifted her high into the air. Jiraiya gave her a disappointed stare, frowning sadly, you really think you're an angel, Don, you. I must kill you, she said. From her wings shot hundreds of papers, each one folded into a point at one end. It is the will of God. Jiraiya rolled out of the way, cheeks bulging as he went through hand seals at light speed. Naruto thrust his right palm out, energy glowing around the skin as he called out the name of his counterattack, Hado no Sanjuichi, Shakaho. Red flame cannon, a ball of red energy shot forwards at blinding speeds, engulfing a large section of the spear-like pieces of paper and incinerating them as if they weren't even there. Using his hand as leverage, Jiraiya spun around and spat a huge ball of oil at the woman, soaking her and her precious paper through. Like a snake, Jiraiya's hair whipped out and wrapped around her as he cried, your paper can't unfold if it's soaked through. He gave her a look, you always did love your origami. I remember you were one of the kindest out of all the kids. What happened to the other two? The rumors that they're all dead are lies, aren't they? She looked down but didn't respond. Jiraiya frowned, I knew it. Pain was one of them too, wasn't he? What do you hope to accomplish by revealing yourself to us again? She asked stoically. You've practically delivered the boy to us on a silver platter. Not what you think, Jiraiya said, especially considering you're part of Akatsuki. I'd heard you were all dead. To think that this is what really happened, sensei. Naruto asked quietly, looking unsurely at the older man. Just pay attention to the conversation, Jiraiya hissed back. You must be thinking, if only I had just listened to Orochimaru. But you didn't, you chose to save us instead, Conan told him. And now, we act to make his plans a reality. Then pain, Jiraiya concluded somberly, must be him. He met her gaze steadily, a few years after I left, I started hearing your names come up occasionally. Anytime there was trouble, whoever opposed your side would wind up dead. You have no idea what happened after you left, she spat angrily, the paper beginning to ruffle. You're absolutely right, I don't, Jiraiya admitted shamelessly. But there's no doubt in my mind that what Akatsuki is doing is wrong. 
Conan opened her mouth to reply, but before she could get a word out, Naruto's sword went sailing through the air. It disappeared into an area between the pipes that surrounded them, followed shortly by a twin gasps. The woman fluttering above their heads donned a look of surprise, then vanished into nothingness as the paper that had constituted her fluttered to the ground. From the area Naruto's sword had flown in, a petite figure stumbled forward past the pipes, her body covered in a cloak decorated with red clouds. She looked up at them, blue hair in disarray and her eyes widened in shock as blood slowly stained her hands, which were held up to her chest. Hyo Rin Maru lay there, embedded through her heart. With a final step forward, she fell to the ground in a thud. Quietly, Naruto retrieved his sword, flicking the blood off it before sheathing it. Jiraiya looked at him, just as shocked, Naruto, you, all of Akatsuki must die, Naruto whispered shakily as he met Jiraiya's eyes. He looked away, down at Conan's body, unsure. All of them, so, you killed Conan, a voice called. The two of them looked up to see an orange-haired man with his long locks tied up in a ponytail, save for the strip that traveled down his right cheek, framing his eyes. Rage smoldered in his gaze, but his countenance was calm. I suppose I have to kill you, then, too. You've changed, Nagato, Jiraiya said, frowning. The orange-haired man didn't give a verbal response, instead clapping his hands together and flying through hand seals. Naruto and Jiraiya tensed as a summoning array drew itself onto the wall of pipes behind him. A large, crab-like creature burst through it, sharp pincers aimed at the two ninja in its path. Natagiri, Naruto cried, slashing at the air twice. Two thin arcs of water leapt forward, one vertical, the other horizontal, and bisected the large beast twice. The pieces vanished in a puff of smoke. So you've perfected it, Jiraiya remarked, glancing at his partner. Natagiri, I mean, slaying several with one sword sweep, I had to do something during my two weeks off, Naruto retorted, eyes glued on his enemy. After all, Hinata-chan had obligations to her team in the village. She couldn't be with me the entire time, could she? Jiraiya smirked a little, but it dropped as he turned his attention back to their opponent, Nagato, there are so many things I want to ask you. Where's Yahiko? I do remember someone by that name, Payne said stoically. He's been dead a long time. Nagato, Jiraiya marveled quietly, shocked and horrified by what that could mean. What happened to you? You used to be so, nothing happened. This is just another fight, Pain said easily. Too many people have died here. Their pain has helped me to grow. What's that supposed to mean? Naruto growled at him, eyes narrowed angrily. Even the most ignorant child will eventually grow up as they learn what true pain is, Pain responded. It affects what they say, what they think, eventually, they become real people. That's not true, Naruto shouted. People grow up by learning to care for others. Someone who knows only pain, can cause only pain. Do you really think that abandoning the love for your friends is the right way to become an adult? Jiraiya demanded of the orange-haired man, his face set in stone. The both of you, you're still just normal people, Pain said, a slight laugh in his voice. But I, living in the center of an infinite universe of pain, have grown into something more. What? Jiraiya asked slowly. That's right, Pain leered. I've grown from a person, into a god. As a god, what I say, what I think, become the laws of a god. You too, you're still just people. I don't really expect either of you to fully comprehend what I'm saying. I can't believe you're the same child that I met so long ago, Jiraiya muttered. Things that I couldn't comprehend as a human are crystal clear now that I'm a god, Pain continued. And, by the same token, I've noticed there are things I can do as a god that I could never even dream of doing as a human. To put it simply, I have evolved. This guy is, Naruto murmured disbelievingly. The white-haired ninja scowled, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm going to put an end to this pathetic world and its wars, Pain said arrogantly. It will be an act of god. Then to what end are you chasing the tailed beasts? Jiraiya asked. I suppose I can tell you, since both of you are going to die anyway, Pain replied, blue eyes frosty. Using the tailed beasts, I will create a new forbidden technique. A technique that will eradicate an entire country in less than a second. It will be the ultimate technique, a weapon of unprecedented power and scale. How can you even think of something like that? Naruto exploded, knuckles white. The air was steadily getting colder. Violence of that kind could never stop wars. Pain turned his eyes over to Jiraiya, when countries quarrel with one another, 
What is the quickest way to end the dispute, Sensei? Answer Naruto's question, Jiraiya stated firmly. Stop dodging, I will give my ultimate weapon to the warring nations, Payne stated. After all, people who have a weapon will inevitably use it. What are you trying to say? The Toad Sage's eyes narrowed. Hundreds of millions of people would die in an instant, Payne declared, eyes gleaming victoriously, and the survivors would be terrified. All the people, all the world, will learn what true pain is. My technique will breed fear and serve as a deterrent, and wars will quickly cease. One might say this world of ours is still growing and becoming more balanced. Pain will quicken the world's growth, as it did mine. Our world is still in infancy, but the hand of God has come to guide it down the path of maturity. You want to teach the world what pain is, to help it grow up faster, Jiraiya repeated, summarizing. And you think that this is your responsibility? I do, Pain answered. I am a god of peace, after all. If you are a god of peace, Naruto stated slowly, his voice even but thick with emotion and his sword drawn. Waves of power swept away from his feet, a bluish aura glowing around his body, then I will become a god of war. A flash of light blinded both Pain and Jiraiya, forcing them to shut their eyes. There was a soft rustle, then a gasp. As Jiraiya's vision came back, he looked up to see Naruto had moved across the room, his sword stabbed through the orange-haired man and wings of ice spread wide. Bishamantan Hyo Rin Maru, Naruto whispered, eyes narrowed. There was a crack, then a puff of smoke. Pain vanished, replaced by a thick log with a hole in it from the stab and a long crevice in it, reaching from the top and bottom of the sword impaling it. It split in half a second later, engulfed in a thick layer of pale, unbreakable ice. Over here, Pain called, standing atop a large, chameleon-like creature. Is that another one of your summons? Jiraiya asked. To me, Pain stated, you're little more than an insignificant child whose growth has been stunted. Jiraiya laughed, going through hand seals, a kid telling me to grow up. That's rich. When the smoke cleared, Jiraiya stood atop a large toad carrying a shield and a club that looked vaguely like a tuning fork, no time to waste with this guy, Gamekin. He bit into his hand, using his fingers to wipe blood on his face and make the design beneath his eyes more elaborate. He looked up, suddenly serious, I'm going to use sage mode. What? Gamekin shrieked, are you? Yes, he replied, I'm going to summon the Nidai Senen. Stall him for a little while, yes. Got it, Gamekin murmured. Pain jumped on the lizard's tongue and was taken into the beast's mouth. An instant later, they vanished from view, invisible. Jiraiya looked around, he's gone. And, says Naruto. Damn, since he's gone, we can only defend. Gamekin's only response was to life his shield. Going through a few hand seals, Jiraiya jumped, slamming his feet against his summon's head. Instantly, a transparent barrier was erected and spread out, covering the area. In response, it seemed, a seven-headed dog leap out of the wall high up, diving towards Jiraiya and Gamekin, both of who were too shocked to react immediately. They didn't have to, however, because a dragon of water appeared from nowhere and slammed into the beast, knocking it into the wall and freezing it in the gigantic hole it made there. It seemed unconscious, then vanished. Creating a hole of their own, Gamekin and Jiraiya escaped into the city outside. Immediately, they were besieged by what looked to be a crow summon, which attacked them with its large beak. Gamekin swung his gigantic shield around, clocking the beast right in its jaw and sending it flying. It vanished in a puff. A large, ox-like summon was pitted against them next, marred by several studs pierced through its head and body. Leaping forward at the beast, Jiraiya cried out, as he did hand seals, Gamekin, go back. It's my turn. The beast rammed into him, throwing both the white-haired ninja and its own head into a wall and creating a large hole there. There was silence for a moment, then a loud, annoying voice called, Brat. Why do you always summon us in places like this? No wonder he's always angry. Ah, don't say that, Ma, a patronizing voice answered. Little Jiraiya was forced to do this, Pa, shut up, the annoying voice called back. I apologize for meeting you here, Jiraiya's voice said, eldest and big sister. But, Brat, Ma asked, didn't you say this would chase away girls? That's why you disliked it. No choice but to dislike, Jiraiya said. My opponent is the Renegan. Whoa, Ma's voice echoed, Raikudo's eyes. I didn't know they still existed. They do, Jiraiya said. So, let's go. A different looking, toad-like, Jiraiya stepped out of the hole in the wall. 
On each shoulder sat an old-looking toad, one male with sparse white hair, the other female, wearing what looked to be a shower cap. The male spoke up, so, where is this guy, anyway? I don't see him. It's not your fault, Jiraiya said, a goatee formed on his chin. He's hiding inside a summoned animal that can blend in with its surroundings. Naruto has performed a similar feat, it seems. Something like a chameleon, you mean? Ma asked. She threw her webbed hands into a seal. I'll find him in no time. By the way, Jiraiya-chan, Pa asked, I realize you need us because this guy's so tough, but why are you fighting him in the first place? He's a former student of mine, Jiraiya said simply. I ain't heard nothing about no other student of yours, Pa exclaimed, looking shocked. He's the destined child, Ma concluded, then why are you fighting him? He didn't grow up to be the man I hoped he would, Jiraiya summarized. Well, whatever the case, if he ain't turned out right, we have to kill him. Pa said. Found him, Ma cried, turning her head to the left. Her tongue shot out, wrapping around midair and revealing the chameleon. With what seemed to be ease, she lifted the large beast off of the ground and threw it back into the harsh earth. Pa spit out what seemed to be a beam of pure energy, slicing through the wall above the beast and sending it tumbling down onto the scaled creature. In a puff of smoke the lizard vanished. That's the Renegan, eh? Ma asked. They're definitely the eyes described in the legends. The orange-haired man stood stoically amongst the wreckage around him, staring calmly at the great Jiraiya. He could not sense the boy who had been with him, no doubt a display of the child's amazing prowess in the ninja arts and his own special abilities. Slowly, he raised his hands and made the correct seals, Kuchio's no jutsu. Two more orange-haired men, both wearing identical cloaks, appeared at the original's feet, kneeling. Jiraiya took notice, but merely reaffirmed his resolution, you're the one who's going to destroy the world, and it's my duty as your teacher to stop you. In a flash, the one with long, unbound hair leapt forward, attacking. As it came near, Jiraiya lashed out with a vicious kick and sent him back towards his fellows. He crashed into the ground, the earth beneath him cracking on impact. Smiling slightly, the original comment, very nice. Jiraiya didn't have time to respond. A dragon leapt down from the pipes and engulfed the downed body in water, splashing all over the place. The two others leapt away to avoid being caught, landing a safe distance away. As the water froze into ice, a figure dropped down from above, plummeting like a rock. Naruto landed with a loud crash, driving his sword through the heart of the frozen body with his crystalline wings spread wide and far. The ice cracked and split, crumbling into pieces beneath both the force of the landing and the pressure of new ice creeping outwards from the attack. Spinning around as he stood, Naruto swiped his sword, unleashing three more dragons that clambered over one another like vicious wolves trying to best one another for the first bite. Even as the dragons bore down on the other two bodies, Naruto swept through more hand seals. As the remaining enemies ducked under his beasts, the splattering water began to take on a new form. Sensatsu Susho, Naruto cried, the creatures of water twisting into thousands of needles. At one, the tiny projectiles flew towards their targets, who dodged out of their path with ease. Still Naruto made seals, and the splashing needles reformed yet again. Several drill-like spikes of water lanced forth. Sweden. Suiga no Jutsu. The original body managed to escape, but the rotund one wasn't quite so lucky. His left leg was sliced from his body, throwing him off balance. Naruto threw a kunai at the empty air, crying, Sensei. Taking his cue, Jiraiya leapt up, grabbing the thrown weapon as he did, and threw it with all his might at the falling body. The sheer force behind the attack drove it straight through the man's skull, killing him instantly. He crashed against the ground with a dull thwack, motionless. Jiraiya landed seconds later, feeling satisfied. Sensing an impending attack from behind, Jiraiya lashed out with a kick, sending the original body back into the wall, stunned. Naruto flew forwards, flashing through even more hand seals as he called back once more, Sensei. I need some oil, Jiraiya and the two toads on his shoulders grinned, leaning back as their cheeks bulged and their chests puffed out. Naruto suddenly halted, behaving similarly as he brought the fingers of his free hand up to his lips. The three of them unleashed a torrent of oil, soaking the orange-haired man to the bone. Even as they continued, Naruto blew out a blazing ball of fire. Jiraiya recognized it as, Kaden, Karyu Enden. Mercilessly, the original body was consumed. 
Jiraiya seriously doubted that the man could possibly have survived that, god, or not. They had won, against all odds, against a foe that seemed to get stronger and stronger each minute, they had managed to defeat him. But something was still bothering him. If Pain was Nagato, then what happened to the black-haired boy he remembered? He didn't see anyone that even looked remotely like that. Still, they had won. To the burning corpse, he spoke, I taught you a long time ago, Nagato, to never underestimate your opponents. He turned and sighed, closing his eyes as the transformation of sage mode began to fade. Behind him, a voice whispered in his ear, didn't you just remind me not to underestimate my enemies, Jiraiya sensei. Jiraiya was a little unsure what happened. The moment the voice had whispered in his ear, he had spun around, a horrible dread settling in his stomach. He was sure he was going to die, but Naruto appeared in front of him as if from nowhere, wings and the shield on his arm raised defensively. Frighteningly enough, those had all but crumbled under the incredible might of the blow. From there, it was pretty straightforward. The force behind the attack had been diminished enough by Naruto's defense that no serious damage was dealt by the initial impact, but it had still sent them crashing through the pipes and onto the lake on the other side. Jiraiya landed on the water, fine but a little shaken. Naruto landed as well, but his bankai had vanished and he was panting. It was a mark, Jiraiya thought, of Pain's strength that Naruto had to use up so much energy to defend one attack. Another thing Jiraiya noticed was the scroll tucked in the back of Naruto's pants, blood splattered along parts of the white. He was impressed, you, I managed to seal up the two that we killed, Naruto said between breaths. I didn't think the charred one would be of any use. Good job, Jiraiya muttered. He didn't get the chance to say anything else, as, standing in the hole their departure had made were four men. Two of them were new faces, though both had at least one piercing on their face and matching orange hair and one of them was the supposedly charred corpse they had killed a few moments before. Pain, he muttered, what are you? The name Pain is shared by all of us, the final one said, glaring. You, Jiraiya stuttered as he recognized the face and hair style, you can't be. Yahiko, but, he just said that you're dead. And, you can't have the Renegan. You can still see Yahiko in me. How funny, the final man remarked. I suppose only his teacher would be able to see what remains of Yahiko. But, make no mistake, he is dead. The man standing here now is pain, no one else. Enough of your bullshit, Jiraiya shouted, are you Nagato or Yahiko? We are pain, the man responded in a menacing tone as they all leapt from their perches. We are God, one of them landed right in front of the blonde, hitting him hard enough to send him back several meters. Jiraiya grew concerned, turning to look for his pupil, Naruto. The peens used the opportunity this presented, taking Jiraiya by surprise as they converged on him. Before he could do anything, he found himself impaled on three long, black objects. The pain followed quickly, and then came the realization that he wouldn't survive this encounter. Sensei, Naruto's voice called, with renewed strength, he struck the one that had hit him, knocking it back and stunning it for a moment. He came upon one of the bodies attacking the white-haired ninja, poised to strike. Jiraiya could see, from the corner of his eye, the last body, the one that Naruto had just hit, look up. A second later, all three peens moved away from Jiraiya, one turning around to block Naruto's attack. The other two flanked him, weapons positioned to stab. That's when Jiraiya realized it. The bodies could see from each other's point of view. That meant that, as long as one stood back and observed, all the others could see everything. Sword still defending, Naruto leapt up over the strange black objects, lashing out with a kick to each of their faces. The both of them went flying, and they didn't look like they'd be getting up anytime soon. With some fancy swordplay, the blonde sliced off the third one's hand, sending the weapon tumbling down to the water's depths. A punch took care of that one, temporarily. As the final pain came up behind him, Naruto seemed to be expecting it. He twisted his sword into a reverse grip and, with both hands holding tight, jerked it backwards, past the right side of his stomach. With a squelch, it became embedded in the chest of the pain he and Jiraiya had charred earlier. With all of his opponents, taken care of, Naruto rushed over to the white-haired man, crying, Sensei, over and over. Naruto, Jiraiya said somewhat weakly, I'm not going to make it. Alarmed, Naruto looked around spotting a small strip of land far enough away to buy him a little bit of time. Grabbing a firm hold of his mentor, 
the both of them were teleported over to that spot with naught but the sound of a fluttering curtain to follow them. As the original laid the man back against a large lantern pole, two clones popped into existence and began chanting as they sat down. Instantly, a large, rectangular barrier was erected, glowing a bright golden color and translucent enough that it could be seen into. Immediately following it, a second barrier of slightly larger size was made, completely transparent and covering the first. A flash of light reflected off of it, then both Naruto and Jiraiya seemed to disappear. I've set up Kaioman and Danku, Mirror Door and Splitting Void, two of the most powerful barriers. Naruto pushed thoughts like that away. I don't know how long they'll hold. Naruto, Jiraiya stated firmly. Ma and Pa were silent. Pain can see from all of his different Bodhi's perspectives. What one sees, they all see. Secondly, he coughed violently, red blood tainting his lips as his sage mode left him more and more. The secret to the true sage mode, the secret to perfecting Ryujin no Terai, is to separate yourself from the dragon within you. What? Naruto asked, bewildered. You must draw on his power, Jiraiya elaborated, but you must control it, harness it, instead of merely accepting it as it is. Only then can you truly advance to the level needed to defeat pain. The real one, the real body behind pain, isn't there, Naruto. Nagato, Nagato wasn't there. Tell that to Tsunade for me. Okay, Naruto said solemnly. And Naruto, Jiraiya wheezed. He seemed to be struggling to get the words out, I've got, one last, last order, Naruto leaned forward, hanging onto every word. His eyes were beginning to water, but he didn't dare let the tears fall just yet. Live, I understand, Naruto whispered. Jiraiya let out a sigh of relief, I could, really, go for, one of those apples, with a final exhale, Jiraiya died, and all was quiet for a moment. Ma and Pa disappeared silently, but the soft puff the maid didn't even phase the blonde teen sitting next to the body of the legendary Jiraiya. Finally, at length, he spoke, my friend, do you fly away now? To a world that abhors you and I, all that awaits you is a somber morrow, he stood, hefting Jiraiya onto his shoulders, and whispered to the air, no matter where the winds may blow, in a flash of yellow, they disappeared. The sun hung low in the sky, casting an orange glow down upon the village. The last vestiges of daylight, of sunlight, flittered around the streets and atop the trees and buildings, casting shadows that danced across the ground and the walls. A soft wind blew through the alleyways, thousands of voices lost to its tender mercies. Five great faces loomed out from a large mountainside, overlooking the village with stern gazes and hard, stony features that would make any Hyuga proud. A crack marred the third face, but it took nothing away from the harsh and protective countenance of the young third Hokage. The streets were deserted, which was odd for the time of day that it was. Night had not yet set in, so several people should still be out. But an ominous air hung over the village, driving all who could feel it indoors and away from whatever could be the cause. It would make things easier on one person. A blonde appeared in the middle of the street, appeared so suddenly and so silently that you might have thought he'd popped out of the ground, walking solemnly towards the five great faces. An arm was slung over his shoulder, and his other shoulder and back were supporting the weight of a motionless white-haired man, whose head drooped and whose eyes were closed. Jiraiya of the Sanin hung limply over his student. I remember, there was this great big apple tree up there, Jiraiya said, gesturing with his arms to give his student an idea about this tree's size. Now, normally, that isn't all that strange a thing. But these apples were very weird. He pulled one out of nowhere, holding it up for Naruto to see. It was apple-shaped, it looked like an apple, but it was pure white instead of red or green. Jiraiya grinned, this is an apple plucked from the largest apple tree planted atop the Hokage Monument. That is the only place in the whole world where you can find white apples. And indeed it was. In all of the places the older man had taken Naruto and his entourage, none of them had ever been gifted with the strange Kyaka whites. That had surprised Naruto greatly. What made Konoha and the Hokage Monument so special that Kyaka whites only grew there? When I die, Jiraiya said suddenly, his tone serious, I want to be buried at the base of that tree. I want to be able to look up at those apples, so round, so beautiful, so delicious, even in death. Where's this coming from all of the sudden? Naruto asked uncomfortably, trying to lighten the mood back up. Plus, you'll probably bring your lady friend up there for a romantic evening of raunchy steaminess. Jiraiya grinned perversely, Naruto snorted, throwing one of the special white apples at the man. It hit him and his head jerked back, 
but he righted himself a moment later to reveal that he had caught it in between his teeth. Shaking his head, Naruto laughed quietly, what am I going to do with you? Naruto, a voice called softly. The blonde stopped walking, but didn't need to look behind him to know who it was. He didn't need to look behind him to see Tsunade standing there, trying her best to be strong and nonchalant and failing just barely. He didn't want to see it. It was pain, Naruto said hoarsely. Jiraiya said, he said to tell you, the real one isn't there. He said to make sure that you knew, that you knew that Nagato's real body wasn't there. Real body, Tsunade asked quietly. Naruto pulled out the scroll with one hand and tossed it to her, saying, that should answer your questions. Where are you going? It wasn't a question, so much as it was a demand to know. He was silent for a moment, then started walking again, to bury him where he wanted to be buried when he died. And where's that? came the follow-up question. Naruto looked up at the Hokage monument, at the sun setting just behind it, and answered her with more finality that he thought he could muster at that moment, with his voice as harsh and raw as it was from crying. Under the apple tree, the cave was deep and dark, endless shadows flitting across the walls and hiding the seemingly unending ceiling above. Water dripped slowly from the various stalactites and down onto the stalagmites. The floor, obscured by boundless black, was barren of all life and of any sign of man. Upon a statue of a grotesque figure, two people were perched. One, with spiky orange hair and glowing blue eyes, sat atop the head of the figure, one leg dangling and the other with its foot pressed up against the statue's skull. His arm rested loosely atop his bent knee while the other was on the cool stone, propping him up. His intense blue eyes, with thin black rings surrounding the pupils, stared seriously up at the ceiling. The second person was also a man, but his features, his face, his eyes, his ears, his body in general, were practically invisible. They would, for all intents and purposes, remain unseen by the general public, and indeed, mostly in private. An orange mask with a spiral design engraved into it hid his face from view, the ominous black band covering his ears. Our plan is coming to fruition, the second man said, perched atop on of the statue's fingers in much the same way his companion was. He didn't bother to look up to see if the other had heard him. He knew that he wasn't being ignored. I have recently captured the other three tailed beasts. All that remain are the eight tails and the nine tails. He looked over at the other man, his red eye gleaming maliciously in the dark, it'll take a few days to seal them up again, but after that, we'll be ready to take care of the other two. The nine tails, the first man muttered to himself, the eight tails. Yes, the second man confirmed flatly, and you, you will be the one to capture and defeat the Kyuubi's container. Namikaze Naruto, the first man said softly. His eyes narrowed as he glared up at the ceiling, his limp hand clenching into a fist. We shall see, which of us is truly a god. Getting sentimental, pain, the second man asked almost teasingly. There was a hint of humor in his voice, a sick and twisted sort of humor that no man should ever have. It was decidedly fitting for the sinister and mysterious figure known alternately as Tobi and as Uchiha Madara, progenitor of the Uchiha clan. Call it what you like, Payne replied dismissively, scoffing at the other's statement. In the end, it seems that this was inevitable. After all, in order to accomplish true peace, the god of peace must defeat the god of war. Isn't that right? Madara chuckled, I think you're letting this whole, god, thing go to your head, pain. Madara looked over at his companion again, his half-lidded red eye barely visible through the hole in his mask, when the time comes, I will protect your real body for you while you send your six paths to capture the nine tails. You are still essential to my plans, so I can't have you dying on me just yet. Pain finally turned towards him, arching a single orange eyebrow, I'm still essential to your plans. I was under the impression that you didn't need me for anything but gathering the nine beasts, Madara. Perhaps you are the one who is getting sentimental. Sentimental. Madara laughed a sick, evil laugh. You flatter yourself. The only reason I need you is to seal the nine beasts up. Everything else, I could technically do by myself. So you say, Payne said airily, turning his gaze back to the ceiling, but it's easy for you to make such claims when you have not fought that boy. Namikaze Naruto, I underestimated him, and I paid the price for it. Not only did I lose two of my six paths, but I comma I also lost Conan. I see, Madara replied neutrally. He switched the subject. Do you think Aizen will keep his end of the bargain? Aizen Sosuke is a very shrewd man, 
Payne said after a moment's pause. He could very well plan to betray us and take the beasts for himself, to do with as he pleases, or he could be as honest as he claims to be and simply be interested in accomplishing the same goals that we seek. He has, lost someone to war, too. His wife, Madara clarified. He scoffed, love, such a thing is fit only for fools. After all, if he hadn't loved her in the first place, he wouldn't have been so devastated when she died. I have to wonder, though, just how far he'll go to get her back. That is what he wants the beasts for, isn't it? Aizen is a very shrewd man, Payne repeated. He has contributed much to our cause, including a great deal of funds and two of the nine beasts. However, I have very little faith that he will be satisfied simply by watching us reach our goals. Aizen will most certainly have something planned for the day when we have the last two. Aizen may be shrewd, Madara admitted, but he has none of the raw power needed to back it up. Let him and his little pet try to take the beasts from us. On that day, Aizen Sosuke will join his wife in eternal slumber. I don't think things are going to be that easy, Payne said firmly. You're not giving Aizen enough credit. He managed to manipulate things enough to destroy any chance Otogakur had of mobilizing an army and get Namikaze Naruto to assault Orochimaru's stronghold in the middle of Hoshigakur, all so sneakily that only Jiraiya's sensei noticed something was amiss. No, we must beware of Aizen. I see, Madara muttered neutrally. But, we haven't heard from him since Orochimaru was killed. For now, we must concentrate on the final two-tailed beasts, the last of the nine. Once we get the three we have now sealed up, your six paths will head to Konoha capture the nine tails. With Namikaze Naruto out of the picture, the most resistance we'd have to worry about would be very minor. The eight tails will seem trivial. Agreed, Pain intoned as he stood. With a winking blur, Madara vanished. Namikaze Naruto, Konoha no Ryujin, Bishamantan, whatever name you take, I shall defeat you. The room was shrouded in dark, illuminated only by the luminous numbers on the alarm clock across from the bed. The windows were shut tight, curtains of ominous black blocking out the daylight that should have been streaming in. In the silence of this room, the only sound that could be heard was the quiet sobbing of one man. Clothes were strewn haphazardly all over the floor, casting the wooden floorboards below them into anonymity. Over the back of the chair was laid a white cotton coat with flames printed onto the bottom hem. The door to the closet was ajar, revealing row upon row of nearly identical clothing. The bed sheets were messy and undone, tangled and balled up in most places, and the pillows were at random spots on the mattress instead of at the head. Even the pristine white of the bed and its furnishings could not cut through the inky gloom of the room, nor let in the moon shining brightly outside the window. There was more than just one person in the room, however. One more people sat with him, watching helplessly as he mourned the loss of one of the most important people in his life. One hand stroked his hair as he cried into her lap, his tears soaking the black fabric of her pants, and the other rubbed circles against his back. Hanada looked down at her beloved sadly as he continued to sob, her delicate, gentle fingers running through the strands of his blonde hair. Despite her best efforts, however, it seemed as if he couldn't be soothed by her touch. She felt helpless, knowing that nothing she could do would save him from this pain. Looking up, Hinata allowed herself a single tear to mourn his sadness. Leaning forward slightly, Hinata started quietly, Shizuka na kono yuru ni anata wo mataru no. Anyo toki washareta hohomi wo tori ni kite, or kara sukoshi dake jiken ga sugite, omoid ga yasashiku nata ne. Hoshi no, Hinata continued, furu basho de anata ga warad irakoto wo itsumo negateta, Ima tuku timo mata eru yone. Itsu, Hanada whispered into his ear, Kara hohomi wa kana ni hakanaku, Hitotsu no machigade kaori shimao kara teizitsu na mano dake wo hakari ni kate tui sora koit yuku suyosade. Hoshi no furu bashoda, she went on. Omoi wo anata ni todokatai itsumo soba ni iru sono sumatasa wo dakashimaru kara. Ima tukutamo, kido erun. Shizuka na yuru ni, she finished in a whisper. Hanada could feel Naruto tighten his grip on her, heard him sniffle as his sobs began to subside. Smiling, Hanada hugged his head to her stomach as she whispered, I'm always by your side, Naruto-kun. I don't know what I'd do without you, Naruto admitted weakly, his blue eyes glassy. And you'll never have to find out, Hanada told him resolutely. Sitting up, Naruto pulled her into a hug, sniffling lightly. Laughing a short chuckle, he said to her, 
to the place where the stars fall, he tightened his grip around her waist, smiling a watery smile, my friend, your desire is the bringer of life, the gift of the goddess. Leaning back, he and Hinata fell onto the mattress, his head resting on the last remaining pillow at the top and her head lying softly against his chest. He looked down at her, at Hinata's pearly lavender eyes. Last order, huh, Naruto looked up at the dark ceiling, talking to the air. He took a deep breath in through his nose. Live, I think I can do that. The sun shined brightly, illuminating the pale blue sky and casting luminous glows over the puffy white clouds coasting lazily through the air. The trill of birds flitting through the wind lilted delicately over the land, singing a serenade of peace and joy to the world around them. Leaves swayed gently in the breeze, but would not be torn from their perches. The ground was decorated with sparse patches of lively green grass, the tiny blades swaying in the swirling wind. The dirt and pebbles crunched and crackled as a single person stepped out onto them, his tan feet clad in black sandals and unprotected from the elements. He wore much of the same color over the rest of his body, save for the white coat fit snugly over his shoulders and flowing down to the middle of his shins. Naruto stopped a moment, his coat fluttering as he closed his eyes. Spreading his arms out slightly, he took a deep breath in through his nose, taking in the scent of nature. The air was crisp and cool, yet carried with it the warmth of summer. The breeze tousled his hair, the blonde strands tickling his nose. With a slight smile on his face, he exhaled slowly, his gloved fingers insensate to the wind. The smell of bright red roses mixed with the scent of lavender still clinging to his clothes, wafting upwards and into his face. A smile curled on his lips. Hanada. Hanada was away with Team 8, Abarame Shino, Inazuka Kiba, and Yuhi Kuranai, on a mission to more firmly establish connections with Nami no Kuni, the land of waves. Ishida Mitsunari was to go with them and return to his life as the royalty of that country. With a few years of training under Jiraiya at his command, Mitsunari would be much more able to defend his territory than anyone else of his line. Tsunade hoped that he would be able to start a hidden village there. That left him alone for another day, with nothing to do but try to do as Jiraiya had spoken in his last moments, to try to follow his last order. In order to follow Jiraiya's last request, though, he also had to perfect his Ryujin no Terai, the Senjutsu that would ultimately allow him to defeat Pain and anyone else he had to face. After all, Toby had to go, too. That was where things became a little problematic. He had been alone to practice this art for nearly a week, and still he had had no true success in his endeavors. He had tried, over and over, to tame the power that Hyo Rin Maru let him borrow, but he could not control it, could not force it to do his bidding instead of taking him over. The secret to the true sage mode, the secret to perfecting Ryujin no Terai, is to separate yourself from the dragon within you. Naruto let out a sigh, eyes downcast, easier said than done, you lecherous old man. And that was true. Perfecting Ryujin no Terai was a lot easier said than it was done, despite Jiraiya's confidence in him. Despite their joint efforts, and their efforts were indeed formidable when joined, neither he nor Hyo Rin Maru had found a way to separate the power from the dragon's consciousness. It seemed veritably impossible. You must draw on his power, but you must control it, harness it, instead of merely accepting it as it is. Only then can you truly advance to the level needed to defeat pain. Okay. Naruto sighed, unsheathing his sword, here we go. Slowly, he moved his left hand up and began the seals, but he was interrupted before he could finish. A flash of light reflected off of his sword, reflecting into his eyes. With a groan, he shut his eyes tight and turned his head to the side, moving his sword out of the light's path. Glaring at the shiny metal, he felt a well of frustration bubble up inside of him. Then, inspiration struck. He needed something to focus on to keep the dragon's conscience from merging with his. Once he had managed it the first time, then he wouldn't need it again, which solved the problem of concentrating on it in battle. It seemed so obvious, now that he had thought of it. Quickly, eagerly, he shed his gloves and stuffed them into his kanai pouch. Suppressing a wince, he ran his index finger down the length of his sword, cutting a small slice into the skin. Bringing it up so he could see it, a bulging drop of blood about the size of a small pebble quivered atop the skin. With a slight smirk, he brought his finger down onto the flat side of the blade and began to draw the symbols. When he finished, he looked proudly at the Horishin Jutsu Shiki slowly drying on the polished steel. Licking the rest of the blood off his finger, 
He keep his eyes on the characters hastily scrawled over his sword and started the hand seals. As he neared the final one, he could feel the technique begin to take effect and quickly concentrated on centering Hyo Rin Maru's consciousness into that small formula. There was a slight struggle as he finished the hand seals, as though the jutsu was fighting to take control of him, but he was much more stubborn than it could ever be. With a final violent push, the pressure that had been building in his skull vanished and he could feel the changes come over him. Bones popped and muscles snapped, becoming stronger and much denser. His vision blurred, then was suddenly a lot sharper than it had ever been. His hair lengthened, his bangs parting to the sides as they grew down to his chin. The rest flowed backwards, surging down his back and reaching nearly to his thighs. He lifted a hand, studying the new shape of his fingers and the tipped fingernails that could now pass for claws. The wind blew, sending several strands of his now silver hair into his eyes for a moment. A second later, it died down and his hair moved back into place of its own will. So, he mused aloud, his voice smooth and deeper than he had known it could be, this is the true power of Ryujin no Terai. He breathed in, and the universe was at his beck and call. A smirk curled on his lips, cyan blue green eyes dancing with excitement, let's try them then, shall we? These spells, the ones that I have had such difficulty with before, let's see if they're any easier in this form. Holding out a hand, he pointed his palm towards a collection of trees that led out into fire country and away from Konoha. Slowly, he floated upwards, his arm changing angle every few seconds to keep the point of impact the same. Finally, when he had reached a height where he could see the true damage of his attack, he said, Hado no Hachijuahachi, here you Gekizoku Shintenraiho. Flying dragon striking heaven shaking thunder cannon, a blinding flash of spirit energy leapt from his hand, lashing out faster than the human eye could track. There was an explosion, so bright that Naruto couldn't properly see what he had hit, then a loud and quick boom. An instant later, the blast was gone, and all that remained was a wide, smoking crater. A small smirk curled on his lips as he examined his unblemished hand. This was the power he needed to defeat pain. There was no doubt about it. The day was clear and bright, the yellow gold sun hanging high in the sky and illuminating all of creation. The temperature was warm, but not hot, and was perfect for a day outside training or playing a game of tag. The wind blew, but gently, caressing the faces of all who stood in its way with a brisk, relaxed cool. On this day, six figures stood out in a crowd, their bodies shaped in various ways and even, in some cases, female or had, at one point, been. Hiding any distinguishing sexual features was a cloak that each of them wore, black with red clouds painted here and there. All of them had vibrant orange hair. The sprawling village of Konoha, the hidden leaf village, lay out in front of them. Six figures stood motionlessly, the lead figure staring at the landscape in front of him with glowing blue eyes. The other five waited patiently for him to comment, or to move, so that they might follow his example. We're going to split up, the first man said suddenly. The other five paths straightened slightly at this, paying close attention. One group will do diversion and the other will do reconnaissance, so let's make sure we've got this sorted out. All five pairs of eyes were immediately latched onto him, waiting patiently for him to elaborate. After a moment of pause, he did so, Demon Realm, Animal Realm, and Hungry Ghost Realm will deal with the diversion. God Realm, Human Realm, and Hell Realm will do recon. Once Namikaze Naruto is encountered, the others are to report to his position immediately. Animal Realm, however, will stay behind and watch from a safe distance. Getting five identical nods, he stepped forward and his eyes widened, glowing blue. What he could see, he relayed to his team, there's a spherical barrier protecting the village from all sides, including above. Any intruders will be detected immediately. As planned, we're going to launch Animal Realm above the village. This will make for an easier insertion. From there, we wait for Animal Realm summons. Two of the remaining five figures moved, the bulkiest one kneeling down is a man with his long orange hair tied in a ponytail climbed up on his arm. An instant later, that man was sent soaring upwards, his hands flying through seals as the air around him rushed past his ears. As he landed agilely on his hands and knees, the five other paths appeared in one puff of smoke. Scatter, God Realm commanded. In a blur, all of them had disappeared. God Realm's blue eyes were sharp and narrowed as he ran through the streets, extending his senses as far as they could possibly go. People gasped and screamed as he passed, terrified of him and his power. 
He felt a slight thrill of satisfaction shoot through him, they had every right to fear for themselves, their lives, and their families. If he had his way, this entire village would cease to exist. A slight whistling noise and a tiny prick on the edge of his senses warned him before his eyes did, and he leapt upwards and over the kunai that had been thrown at him. Dully, in a corner of his mind, he could sense that the other five paths had encountered a similar situation themselves. Backtracking, he kneeled down and looked at the kunai, attached to which was a small paper note. Written on this small piece of white paper was a single word, a single term that nearly forced a tiny smile on his lips. Written, in clear, bold script, on the small piece of paper was the word, come. He reached down, already aware of the kunai's purpose. There was a strange sensation, almost like a tug behind his navel, and he was suddenly somewhere else, standing, bent over, on a field of grass with the kunai in his hand. Letting it drop, he stood up straight and noticed the other five paths do similarly, each one having had a kunai with a small piece of paper on it. God realm turned around as animal realm disappeared, locking gazes with the fierce blue eyes of Namikaze Naruto. Calmly, he spoke, you were expecting us. Oh, Naruto asked rhetorically. You're much smarter than I gave you credit for. Then again, it doesn't take a god, he emphasized the word sarcastically, to figure out that I was expecting you. After all, you want the nine-tailed fox sealed inside of me, and I want you dead for all of the things you've done. A bold claim, God Realm said stoically. But, then again, you already know the truth don't you? The real one isn't there, Naruto recited calmly. Sensei told me all about that before he succumbed to his wounds. So tell me, Nagato, why have your last path stay back when you won't truly die until I kill your real body? You are clever, God Realm praised. The answer is quite simple, really. If all six of my paths of pain should be defeated, you would have no way of finding the real me, which would make a final battle rather difficult to achieve. So Animal Path is left behind and will summon a sort of messenger bird for you to follow on the off chance you defeat the other five. I see, Naruto nodded. I suppose, then, that Toby is waiting to engage me wherever it is that this bird of yours would lead me to. You are clever, God Realm hid his surprise quickly. But, cleverness only gets you so far in battle. You need the power to back it up. Instantly, Asura Path, the one that had shattered Naruto's wings of ice and nearly caused a great deal of damage to Jiraiya, leapt forward, fist lashing out at the blonde teen's face. Smoothly, Naruto ducked under the punch and sliced through the overextended arm from knuckle all the way up to his shoulder. Then, in what seemed to be a speed ten times faster, he brought his sword across the other man's waist and split him in half from crown to crotch, all with two simple slashes. You've gotten stronger, God Realm remarked, standing motionlessly. That seemed to be the cue for human realm to attack, holding on to the strange black object they had been prone to using before. His arm came around in a diagonal swing, but Naruto met him easily, the pristine steel of Hyo Rin Maru effortlessly holding up against the mysterious black material. Leaping backwards, Naruto unleashed a dragon of icy water, its red eyes gleaming as it soared forwards, screaming through the space separating him and his enemy. Human Realm jumped up and over it, his efforts sending him far enough to reach his opponent. Aided by both his amazingly monstrous strength and by the insistent pull of gravity, he brought his weapon down. Naruto deflected it to the side, which seemed to set off a chain reaction. The moment the long-haired man had been repelled, a torrent of water was sent spiraling in his direction. Bring his sword around, the edge of the blade glowing blue, he swung downwards as the ball of water came his way. Natagiri, he cried, the blue arc slicing the attack in half and continuing onwards towards God Realm, who had sent the Debakufu at him. God Realm seemed unfazed by the return attack, merely holding up one of his hands as if he were catching a ball. The Natagiri arc stopped short, then a ripple seemed to move outwards, destroying it in a burst of liquid. His hand fell back to his side as if nothing had ever happened at all. As if he could see out of the back of his head, Naruto performed a back flip over human realm as the long-haired man attempted to stab him, going through hand seals in midair. Stopping, he took a deep breath and blew out a large fireball, aimed at the man who had tried to get him from behind. His efforts were in vain, however, as the singular female path leapt in front of it and held out her hands. There was a pause, as if the universe were waiting for something to happen, and then the fireball sputtered weakly before it winked out of existence. The orange-haired woman looked up at Naruto stoically,
her blue eyes gleaming dully. As he landed, however, Naruto was unprepared for the harsh shoulder that struck him from the side and sent him flying, tumbling over the ground. In mid-roll, he flung himself back up and stumbled into a standing position. He was breathing hard, panting as he gingerly rubbed his right side. He let out a groan, but knew that he would be okay. It wasn't anything truly serious. Human Realm was upon him again, lashing out with slash after vicious slash as Naruto struggled to keep up, distracted, as he was, by the pain in his side. Reaching out with his hand, Human Realm pushed Naruto back, who was too surprised by the move to do anything to defend against it. Leaping up into the air, Naruto slashed down at Human Realm, intent on cleaving the man in two. Almost effortlessly, it seemed, the orange-haired man held his weapon with one hand and blocked it. With a jerk of his arm, he sent the blonde flying backwards into the tree line, not bothering to follow him into it. There was a pause, during which God Realm's eyes narrowed suspiciously, before a cry of, Bankai, resounded throughout the area. In reaction to that call, it seemed, the sky darkened with black rain clouds and three water dragons, each sporting a pair of feathery-looking wings, flew out from the foliage, mouths agape and showing off long, sharp fangs. Any tree they so much as brushed was instantly frozen solid. Human realm leapt over the first dragon as it crashed into the ground, staring the second dragon in the face as it prepared to consume him, but god realm raised his hand and his comrade was propelled upwards and out of the way. The third dragon rose up and broke apart as, from its mouth, came the winged form of Naruto, a long tail following behind him. The instant the two weapons came into contact, the strange black object that human realm was holding in Hyo Rin Maru, the black metal became cold and engulfed in ice. Surprised, human realm could not react fast enough to block the second slash that cut straight through his only defense and cleaved off his right arm at the shoulder, sending the amputated limb spiraling down to the earth below. Human realm landed in a sort of crouch, gazing impassively up at the floating Naruto, whose strange powers kept him airborne. There was a tense moment of pause, as if the two enemies were sizing each other up, then Naruto exploded into action, sending three more dragons down at Hell Realm, who had smashed into him with his shoulder. Hell Realm leapt backwards from the first dragon, then turned around the second he landed and headed towards the trees, where he intended to lead the beasts into the wood. He hadn't moved more than a meter or two, however, before Naruto appeared in front of him and unleashed another trio of the deadly creatures. Stunned, Hell Realm could do nothing to avoid them. God Realm, however, raised his hand once more and pointed it at Hell Realm. Just as the dragons were about to consume him, he was jerked out of the way and landed on his butt in front of God Realm, who looked down at him impassively. Naruto glared at them, his blue eyes gleaming dangerously. The blonde stabbed his sword into the ground, and from the soil in front of him sprouted thick, jagged pillars of ice. With a sideways sweeping motion of his free hand, the pillars disintegrated into a fine mist, the watery particles glistening in the limited light. As if he were throwing something, his hand shot out, and with it, the mist darted forward like tiny projectiles. Kongo Hakori, he called out. Diamond Dust God Realm raised his hand, and, with a look of concentration on his face, the mist was banished back at its creator. Naruto's eyes widened, but his body reacted almost on reflex and his left hand reached down into his kanai pouch. It pulled out a tri-prong kanai, at which point Naruto seemed to have overcome his surprise. Looking up, he flung the kanai into the sky as fast and hard as he could. Just as the diamond hard mist was about to hit him, he disappeared in a flash of yellow. As one, all of the remaining paths looked upwards, towards the blonde hovering in midair. With an angry snarl and a single swing, three more dragons were released. Instead of making a straight path for the enemy, though, they curled around, spinning in a circle and surrounding their targets. In the sky, the blonde team was making hand seals with his left hand. Sensatsu Susho, he started in a whisper as he hit the last seal, Daikimusho. Instantly, the trio of winding dragons shattered and reformed into thousands of tiny needles. God Realm studied the prison of icy prongs stoically, his head zipping back and forth as the needles quivered threateningly, then jerked forward at some unheard signal. As they converged on him, he flung his hands out and was consumed by the horde. A second later, however, the gigantic prison of ice shook, and then dispersed back into water, revealing a panting god realm and an unscathed hell realm. Standing straight, but still out of breath, god realm began hand seals as the moisture in the ground churned and morphed to his will. 
At the last seal, a giant dragon of water, with gleaming yellow eyes, formed, Sweden, Swiryuden no Jutsu. Calmly, as the beast of water rushed towards him, Naruto held out a single hand, palm pointed forward. In an even voice, he recited, Hado no Ichi, Sho. Thrust as it bore down on him, the Swiryuden was ripped apart with what seemed to be little to no effort at all. Moving the angle of his arm, he aimed his palm at God Realm and Hell Realm, his blue eyes glaring down at them. With the same calmness as before, he stated the name of his next technique, Hado no Rokujusen, Soren Sokatsui. Twin Lotus Blue Fire, crashed down two balls of blue fire shot forth, growing steadily in size as they came screaming down toward God Realm and Hell Realm. Hungry Ghost Realm appeared in front of the blasts, holding her hands out in front of her as the two spheres came steadily closer. Her face screwed up in concentration, she let the energy balls touch her palms. Her expression quickly morphed into surprise as the attack met no resistance and still came toward her. She was engulfed in a fiery explosion, and, when it subsided, not even a shred remained. Looking up at Naruto, God Realm's eyes flashed with a blazing rage. Holding up a single hand, his mouth set in a frown, he pulled. Surprised, Naruto was jerked out of the sky and towards the ground. Hell Realm's fist awaited him, sending him flying in the opposite direction and into a vicious kick from human realm. His wings shattered and the icy gauntlet on his right arm cracked. Helpless, Naruto could only gasp and grasp weakly at his enemy's arm as he was easily picked up by his neck with human realm's remaining hand. Glaring at him, Human Realm's lips twisted into a characteristic smirk as he suddenly spun around on his heel and threw Naruto into one of the trees that had provided such good cover earlier. Crying out as the bark bit into his back, Naruto panted as God Realm turned to him, a superior look on his face. Glaring back at them, Naruto slowly stood as the ice on his arm shattered and fell to the ground. With a bit of difficulty, he stood straight and began his hand seals, it seems that this was necessary after all. At the last seal, his body shuddered and shifted as he spoke the name of this new skill, Ryujin, Reigen Indo. Dragon God. Heartless Requiem with vicious snaps and cracks, bones moved and became denser, muscles became stronger, leaner, more agile, and raw strength was multiplied. Blonde hair became silver, lengthening down the teen's back and reaching nearly to his thighs. Yellowish gold bangs shifted to a delicate pale, shimmering gray and parted down the center to frame a more angular face, reaching down to his chin. Cat-like cyan eyes snapped open, slit pupils staring intensely at the world. Behold, he spoke, in a smoother, deeper voice, one that spoke of power, the true might of the dragon god. 100%. As he said this, he swiped his sword to the side and it seemed to grow, lengthening to nearly half again what it had been. Looking up at them through a curtain of silver hair, a small smirk curled on his lips, ready, he seemed to dissolve into tiny particles of water, a black mist, then reappeared in front of human realm, sword already in motion. The long blade cut through the orange-haired man like butter, from one hip to the other. Time seemed to slow as the pieces of the man moved in separate directions, a look of surprise on his face. Then it was over, and Naruto sliced diagonally through the upper half of his enemy's remains, from right shoulder to what remained of the left side of his stomach. Three down, Naruto said tauntingly, in a blur, he had vanished again and Hell Realm held up his own black rod, blocking against the steel of Hyo Rinmaru. Leering slightly, Naruto leaned forward, you think this can stop me? As if on cue, the black rod was cut in half at the middle, its wielder following it soon afterwards. Hell Realm was split diagonally, much the same way his predecessor, Human Realm, had been. His two halves fell to the ground in opposite directions, leaving God Realm and Animal Realm as the last two of the six paths. And thus ends, Naruto spoke, the great pain. He flung several kunai, watching as God Realm held out a hand and banished them in the opposite direction. Appearing in front of the final fighter, Naruto lopped off his right hand, then spun around and, using his momentum, sliced right through God Realm. With a look of surprise on his face, God Realm fell to the ground, cut in half. I see, animal path said as Naruto turned to look at it. Flashing through hand seals, he summoned a small sparrow, which fluttered and then took off. Follow this bird and he shall lead you to the real body. With a small smirk, Naruto sent a Natagiri arc at animal path. The last remaining path seemed to accept his fate and was beheaded swiftly. As the final path fell to the ground, 
Naruto turned his gaze to the small sparrow with a long red ribbon attached to its leg and took off after it. The place the sparrow led him to seemed fitting for the leader of Akatsuki, it was dark and bleak, a cave that was familiar but still foreign. The forest ended abruptly several meters away, and the sparrow fluttered towards the dark entrance. A kunai struck it before it could, however, and Naruto looked down at the man who had thrown it, his silvery hair swaying in the wind. So we meet at last, Toby said calmly, staring at him from behind his orange mask. Namikaze Naruto, the dragon god, the god slayer, god slayer. Naruto asked amusedly, that's a new one, it's only fitting, Toby shot back. After all, once the people of the former Hidden Rain village, Omegakur, find out that you killed Pain, that's what they'll start to call you. Naruto laughed, I suppose so. He seemed to move at light speed, appearing behind Toby and slicing straight through the black-clad man's body, but all settle for killing you. Ah, Toby cried, as if in pain. It quickly turned into a laugh as Naruto's face twisted in confusion. I'm afraid it'll take a lot more than just that to defeat me, Namikaze Naruto. Frowning, Naruto lashed out with another slash, this one horizontal, which went right through Toba's body, but it was as if there wasn't anything there. Toby laughed, walking steadily backwards as Naruto's attacks brought him slowly forward. Each time the blade passed through the masked man's body, it was like swinging at air. Hopping backwards, Naruto flung his hand out, index finger pointing at his enemy, and said, Hado no Kaiyuju, Kurohitsugi. Black coffin, a black box formed in midair and fell on top of Toby, encasing him in a strange, inky energy. At once, spear-like prongs of energy formed at various points on the outside of the box, then, a second later, stabbed forward into the black. There was no scream or cry of pain, not even the slightest trace of blood. My, Toby commented from behind him, leaning against a tree, that looks painful. It would have been, Naruto said neutrally. He turned to face the masked man. So, Itachi was right about you, Madara. Ooh, Toby clapped his hands sarcastically, so, you know. You're much smarter than I expected you to be. And you're much stronger than I expected you to be, Naruto retorted. He smirked suddenly, and turned around, saying, catch me if you can, before he vanished into the trees. A second later, Madara leapt forward and followed him into the thick undergrowth, red Sharingan eye glaring. The chase lasted an unexpected length of time, something that frustrated Madara. No matter how easily he could see the path that Naruto was going to take, the silver-haired menace was always one step ahead of him. If the Uchiha progenitor didn't know any better, he might suspect that his foe had a Sharingan as well, or some ability of a similar nature. Finally, they reached a clearing. Naruto landed in the middle of it and spun around as he leapt backwards towards the other side. He unleashed two kunai as Madara landed in the same spot he had just vacated, but the two metal blades passed right through the man, who stopped and looked up as his prey found a perch on one of the trees. Did you really think you could catch me off guard? Madara laughed as Naruto stared at him. The silver-haired shinobi merely raised his hand into a single hand seal. If it didn't work before, what made you think it would work this time? Perhaps you're not as smart as I, ugh. Perhaps you're a bit dumber than I thought. Naruto smirked, his hand slowly returning to its place at his side. I'd tell you to look at the seals attached to those kunai, but the only thing you can do now is breathe. Madara struggled to move, but his body wouldn't obey him. He stood stock still, his arms refusing his commands and his legs frozen in position. He breathed and his heart was beating, but anything beyond the essentials was lost to him, and he was angry because he couldn't understand why. Those kunai, Naruto started smugly, are very special. There's something Jiraiya cooked up when Itachi told us about you. Since we didn't know the true extent behind your power, he figured that he couldn't take any chances. Anyone of Uchiha blood standing within two meters of those kunai, when they're activated, of course, will lose all higher motor function and be frozen in their last pose. You can't even use chakra. Still smirking, Naruto slowly lifted a hand into the sky, I've never tried this before outside of Shikai, so I don't know if it'll work, but we'll see. The dark cloud suddenly parted, revealing a large hole. From it, white light shone down, fluttering at the edges. Then, bits of it started to fall, and Madara realized that it wasn't light at all, but brilliantly pure snow. It all seemed to fall in slow motion, making a beeline for him with unmistakably lethal intentions. Behold, Naruto said, Hayout and Hayakuso. 
Frozen Heaven's Hundred Flower Funeral, a single snowflake landed on Madeira's hand and bloomed into an icy flower, followed quickly by another and another. Madara wanted to scream, but he could not move his mouth and could not force it past his vocal cords. He barely noticed when Naruto started to speak again. With this technique, snow falls to the ground, Naruto explained. When the snow touches someone, however, it blooms into flowers, and for every snowflake that lands on that person, another flower will bloom. You cannot avoid it any more than you can dodge raindrops. And, when the last flower, the 100th, blooms, that person's life ends. Madara attempted to scream, but, at that moment, the final flower bloomed and, with a flash of light, Madara died. All that remained was his frozen body in a mountain of icy flowers. And so ended one of the most powerful shinobi since the Rakuto Senen. In what seemed to be a shroud of wispy black feathers, Naruto's long silver hair and other changed features faded away, leaving behind the spiky blonde hair and the bright, sky-blue eyes. Hyo Rin Maru shortened back into a katana, but, engraved into one side of the blade, was the word, salvation, and, on the other side, destruction. Naruto did not spare the mountain another look and focused instead on the giant cave a few meters off, standing with a large, gaping mouth for an opening. As he walked past the rocky threshold, a pair of bright blue eyes opened up inside the darkness. As if spurned on by his presence, several flames flared to life, igniting around him in small canisters. Torches, each one crudely done and stabbed into the wall, sometimes lopsidedly, other times, miraculously, straight. Placed in the exact center of the floor was a monstrous structure, sprouting up from the ground and towards the fathomless ceiling. It had nine eyes, only seven of which were open, and two arms that reached up from the dirt. Its mouth was open wide and gaping, showing off several fang-like teeth made from what looked like hard clay. As light flooded the cave, the owner of the eyes was identified. He was hunched over inside a monstrous machine, emaciated until he was but skin and bones, shirtless. From his back protruded an innumerable amount of black rods. His blue eyes were familiar, with several thin black rings surrounding the pupil in a sea of azure. His red hair reached his shoulders, the bangs parted above his left eye and obscuring most of his right. He looked, Naruto thought, much as Jiraiya had described him, though weaker. You, you're Nagato, Naruto asked in a whisper. His hand clenched into fists. You're the one, who's caused so much pain. Huvu killed Jiraiya Sensei. I am, Nagato rasped. And this is the price I paid for my dream. Do you pity me? Yes, Naruto answered honestly. But I, I hate you, too. All the people who have died for your dream, your impossible dream, they didn't have to. They died because of you. Peace is not impossible, Nagato said hoarsely. And is it not a worthy dream? A peaceful world, where people like us do not have to exist, where war is a figment of the imagination, is that not a worthy dream? But your methods weren't, Naruto shouted. A forced peace is no peace at all. A peace brought by fear isn't right, it wouldn't last. Peace, true peace can only be brought by understanding each other, by talking and by compromise. Any other kind of peace isn't worth it. I did what I must, Nagato said solemnly, just as you will do as you must and end my life. There was a pause, then the man smiled an odd sort of smile, reminiscent and fond. You are indeed Jiraiya Sensei's student. I could never bring myself to believe in what he said, not after Yahiko died. But now, I'll believe in you. I'll have faith that you can accomplish my dream. Naruto stepped forward and lifted his sword, then, this is the end. This is, where you die. Nagato gave a raspy chuckle, I died long ago, first with Yahiko, then with Konan and Jiraiya Sensei. Do not pity the dead, Namikaze Naruto. Pity the living, pity those who live without love. Nagato lifted his head and looked Naruto in the eye. Above all, pity those who have no dreams. Naruto steeled himself, then lunged forward and stabbed Nagato through the heart, who gave a final sigh and sagged with what appeared to be relief into death. Naruto pulled away and flicked the blood from his blade, then relaxed. It's over, he sighed, tilting his head back as he closed his eyes in relief. It's finally over. The sound of a man clapping drove his attention back down to earth, his eyes seeking out the origin of the disturbance. They locked onto an average-looking man with short, wavy brown hair wearing a pair of square-framed glasses. He had a disarming smile on his face, but Naruto had seen enough dishonesty to know that the smile was as fake as plastic. The strange thing, though, one that sent a feeling of dread through the blonde, 
was that the smile was also quite real. He was sincerely satisfied by something, but what? Well done, the man said in a calm, friendly voice. Indeed, you did a very good job, Namikaze Naruto-san. That was a most impressive display of skill. I can see now why they call you the Dragon God of Konoha. Who are you? Naruto asked suspiciously. The man, who was wearing an expensive, ornate kimono, hakama, and haori set, merely smiled. In that same voice, that same nonchalant, friendly tone, as if they had been on good terms for ages, he said, Oh, I doubt you've heard of me. Our countries don't get along very well, you see, so I'm afraid we've never met before. Still, I imagine we would have been very good friends. Who are you? Naruto asked a little more forcefully, his blue eyes glaring. Oh, I apologize, the man said politely, still in that same tone of voice. He didn't seem at all threatened by the one who had just beaten one of the strongest shinobi since Hanzo the Salamander and killed the man Omegaker called, God. I didn't introduce myself, did I? How very rude of me. My name is Aizen Sosuke, though most people seem to like to call me, Aizen Sama. It gets on the nerves after a while. Aizen, Aizen, where had he heard that name before? This guy, though, he wasn't a ninja, Naruto could tell. He didn't have the feel of a ninja about him, and his hands, from what Naruto could see, were too soft to belong to a ninja. And yet, this, Aizen wasn't afraid of him, wasn't afraid that his life could be ended in an instant. It was chilling. I really must thank you, Aizen went on, still smiling that damnable smile. If it hadn't been for you taking care of these guys, I might have had to take care of them myself, and that would have been problematic. You see, because of you, because you killed Orochimaru for me and took out the army outpost Hidden Sound was using to build up its forces, the smile turned almost sinister, there's no one in my way. That's when it came to him. He suddenly remembered where he heard the name, Aizen Sosuke. Was this all the work of Aizen Sosuke? A smile actually curled on Shigi's lips as he dragged himself into a kneeling position, so sharp, as always, Jiraiya-sama. Yet, so naive, you, Naruto whispered, shocked. You're. He didn't get to finish, as a fireball crashed into him and flung him several meters, where he came to a stop on the floor. In the flickering light of the torches, he could see a familiar clothing style, a fishnet mesh undershirt, and a long, open coat that went down to his knees. Typical shinobi pants and sandals, black. But the face and hair were different, and he was wearing black gloves. The eyes were an eerily familiar cyan color with slits for pupils, and the skin had gone to a porcelain pale. The bangs were parted at the center, chin length and framing his face. The rest of his hair surged down his back and nearly to his thighs. It was silver. Shigi, Naruto asked, shocked. Oh, yes, Aizen said suddenly, looking as if he'd just remembered something. I suppose you have met my subordinate before, haven't you? I imagine he looks quite a bit different than you remember. That's another thing I have you to thank for, you know, and it wouldn't have been possible if you hadn't killed Orochimaru and left that strand of beautiful silver hair behind when you took out Didera. What? Naruto's head whipped around. Oh, yes, Aizen smiled. With Orochimaru gone, it was child's play to take his genetic splicing technology. And the hair sample you left behind provided me with enough genetic material to properly perform the procedure to endow Shigi with your godlike powers. Turning around, Aizen said airily, do with him what you like, Shigi. I have to figure out how to use this wonderful statue. That seemed to be all the incentive Shigi needed, as he surged forward, slashing at the blonde with his ninjutsu. Naruto just barely blocked it, stumbling to his feet. Relentlessly, Shigi attacked, and each time, Naruto just barely evaded death and serious injury. Oddly enough, beyond that initial fireball, Shigi hadn't used anything but his sword. This is your power, Ryujin, Shigi said calmly. I will defeat you with it and claim it as my own. Your, grunt, insane. Naruto called, arms shaking with the effort of defending against his enemy's blows. It seemed hopeless. Naruto had used all of his power to defeat Nagato and Madara. There was nothing he could do that could hope to match Shigi at the level he was at, and he was quickly beginning to tire. Think. He told himself. Think. Shigi took advantage of his moment of strategizing, pulling his sword back and landing a solid palm strike against Naruto's chest. It looked to be a simple push, but to Naruto, it felt like he had just been hit with a giant tree. He was flung backwards several meters, 
tumbling a few moments before he slid to a halt on his stomach. As the blonde raised his head, Shigi walked towards him ominously, sword held tightly in his fist. Naruto cringed. Hyo Rin Maru, he called to the dragon desperately. Can't, came the weak reply. Not enough, energy, I could lend you mine, a deep voice interrupted. Naruto's heart stopped for a moment, and the world seemed to follow. But, why should I let you borrow my power? If I die, so do you, Naruto told the Nine Tails. If I live, then you live longer as well. Death would be an awfully big adventure, came the reply, casual. Why should I lend you my strength? I get nothing, in the end. Because I need it, Naruto told it angrily. I don't care if you're the strongest of all the tailed beasts. If you don't lend it to me, I'll take it. The response was a deep, satisfied chuckle. I like you, kid. You've got guts, and I respect that. I'll lend you my power, for now. Take as much as you need. An overwhelming sense of anger began to fill Naruto as the Kyuubi's chakra began to leak from the seal, and he shook his head, desperately going through hand seals. He couldn't allow the chakra to control him, he had to control it. The only way he knew how to do it, he just hoped that it worked with the demon's chakra as a focus, this time. There was an angry howl in the back of his mind as he wrenched the Kyuubi's taint and influence from the chakra surging through his body. Instantly, his wounds healed and his fatigue disappeared. Like before, he could feel the changes come over him, but they were less violent. His muscles became stronger and denser and his fingernails sharpened into pointed claws. Around him, a brilliant orange aura came to life, clinging to his skin. Wisps of it lifted into the air like fire, and the aura was so dense and compact that it was difficult to tell where his skin ended and his clothes began. There were several dark markings down his front, complete with the spiral that was the Kyuubi's seal and a ring of yang symbols that surrounded his neck. Slowly, as Shigi stopped at the powerful presence Naruto now radiated, the blonde stood. His voice had an echoing, wavering quality to it, as though he were talking underwater, thousands of leagues of heavy liquid pressing down on him, Kamui, Regan no Tenshi. Might of the gods, heartless angel quickly, before Shigi could react, Naruto flung his hand out, Bakudo no Rokujuichi, Raikujokuro. Six rods prison of light, six thin but wide rods of yellow light stabbed Shigi's abdomen, holding him in place. Grunting with frustration, he stared down at the beams and started pounding them with his sword, trying desperately to break them. Naruto seemed to find this amusing, I'm afraid that won't work. At this level, my raw power will prevent you from overwhelming that binding spell. He held up a finger, a ball of white energy glowing in front of the tip. With a small smirk, he said, goodbye. With a blast of white lightning, Shigi was no more. Turning around, Naruto found Aizen looking at him with something akin to surprise. Faintly, the brown-haired man whispered, oh. As Naruto held up his finger again, a black box fell on top of Aizen, enveloping him. With fierce, Stern orange eyes, Naruto sighed and said a three simple words as the spears formed, Sayonara, Aizen Sosuke. In the year following the defeat of Akatsuki, and, ultimately, the death of pain, the balance of power between the five great nations shifted almost irreversibly. The former Omegakur, now without a leader, collapsed into anarchy. It was only inevitable that it would erupt once more into civil war as multiple factions fought to take the place that pain had left vacant. The disappearance of Aizen Sosuke, a prominent feudal lord in the land of Earth, also had an effect. Down their best strategist, their de facto leader, and one of their best shinobi, the village of Hidden Stone was weakened to the point where many didn't consider it one of the five great hidden villages anymore. It would, unfortunately for its people in the Suchikage, never regain its former glory. In the end, the territory belonging to Hidden Sound and the former rice country became a part of Fire Country, further adding to Kanaha's superiority as compared to the other villages. A few months later, the Hidden Wave village would enter into a strong, permanent alliance with the Hidden Leaf village, further augmenting the Land of Fire. Iwagakur, in an attempt to keep itself from annihilation, declared Konoha superior to itself and entered into its own alliance, a submissive one, with the greatest of the five powers. Kumogakur, aware that it had little chance of winning should any more countries join the Land of Fire, made a non-aggression pact with the remaining hostile nations, including Kurigakur. Together, they launched a massive assault on the Hidden Leaf Village in an attempt to restore the balance of power to the way it had been, or even in their own favor. They failed. Waiting for them, 
It seemed, at the gates of the village was a single shinobi, a blonde with spiky hair and wearing a slightly familiar white coat, a sword slung over his shoulder. In a calm, quiet, polite voice, he asked them to retreat and promised that no one had to die. The mass of ninja, hundreds upon thousands of them, laughed at him. Frowning, he had held up a single hand and snapped his fingers. A kunoichi with her silky brown hair pulled into two buns, one on either side of her head, leapt above them and pulled out a scroll. When she flung it open, thousands of kunai were released into their number, but none of them hit anyone. That had only made them laugh harder, but those kunai had been their undoing. With a frighteningly familiar yellow flash, the blonde disappeared and, one by one, their numbers had fallen. Only the rakage and his brother, the container of the eight tails, remained. It was an epic clash, one worthy of the history books, between the blonde and the two brothers, but, even with the power of the eight tails, they were no match for the one technique that ended it all. Kamui. Reagan no Tenshi. With no ninja left, no military with which to fight, and no leader to hold them together, Kumogukur collapsed into nothing and became several different countries, each warring with each other. Inside the Empire of China, they were quickly quelled and became a part of the ancient power claiming the Mandate of Heaven. Kurigakur, now lacking a great deal of its shinobi, entered into an alliance with Konoha to preserve its independence. Thus, in the few remaining countries that considered Konoha an enemy, the name Namikaze Naruto soon took on new titles. He was called Konoha no Ryajin, God of War, the Flash Reborn, God Slayer, and even, the Azure Moon. He was the second shinobi in history to be given the double S ranking in the bingo books. And so, with the greatest shinobi since the Rakuto Senen on their side, Konoha became the strongest force in the world of ninja. Now, three and a half years later, it remains so. I'm proud to announce, a voice said over the roaring approval of the crowd. Hanada looked up, watching as a 20-year-old blonde man, her husband, walked out onto the balcony. Tsunade continued, the sixth Hokage, Namikaze Naruto. The roar from the crowd rose in volume, increasing to deafening. Hanada smiled and clapped politely along with the enthusiasm. An elbow in her side drew her attention over to Tenten, who was smiling and clapping as well. The brunette leaned over to her, seems like you made a good choice, didn't you, Hanada? Marrying him, I mean. Giggling, Hanada turned her attention back up to Naruto. Together, she and Tenten whispered, congratulations, Naruto-kun. Hokage-sama, a voice called, its owner bursting through the double doors of the Hokage's office. Naruto frowned, looking up from his paperwork at the Anbu who stood in front of him, panicking. Hokage-sama, the Anbu went on. Danzo is on the move. Naruto stood in one fluid motion, quickly shedding his Hokage robes and hat and grabbing his signature coat on the way out the door. The Anbu followed closely behind him as he strode quickly from his office, intent on settling the problem before him. Tell me what's going on. Has he assaulted the village? Yes, the Anbu said swiftly, breathing in short pants. Root has begun an attack on the village's major clans. Our ninja are in disarray and communications are shot. My squad leader ordered me to inform you of the situation. Danzo is moving towards this very tower as we speak. I see, Naruto mumbled. Louder, he said, grab as many as the council members as you can, inform them of the situation. After that, begin evacuation into the forest and the training areas. Not the mountain tunnels, the Anbu asked hesitantly. No, Danzo knows standard protocol, Naruto explained. He could easily gain an advantage if we follow normal SOP. What we need to do is what he'll least expect, so we'll evacuate into the surrounding forest and the training areas, places where it isn't exactly safe but isn't seriously dangerous. Understood, the Anbu said, moving to follow his orders. A hand stopped him, Hokage-sama, Naruto moved swiftly, chopping the back of the man's neck. He fell to the floor, unconscious. Naruto mumbled, sloppy, Danzo. The councilman's quarters are in the east districts, not the west. He looked up, Kakashi. Did you get all of that? Kakashi walked out from behind the office's open doors, yeah, I got all of it. Should I pick up guy? Naruto shook his head, no, just send one of your dogs. We need to take care of this before it escalates too far. As it is, we're going to have to let the clans fend for themselves. Until we re-establish order, we'd only be spreading our forces too thin. Right, Kakashi nodded, closing his book with a snap. 
he moved to carry out his orders, only to pause. Naruto, be wary of Danzo. He wasn't the Sandime's teammate for nothing, you know. You shouldn't underestimate him. Naruto grimaced, then began down the steps, I know. Several flights of steps later, Naruto opened the doors to the tower and stepped out into the sunlight. A ninja flew towards him, but he cut the man down with a simple, effortless slash of his sword. The sounds of an epic battle raged on in the background, and several fires burned bright in the midday sun. Several more ninja assaulted him, but he defeated them all easily, as though he were fighting mere children and not highly trained warriors. Still, they came, attacking in swarms and unable to realize that they could not defeat him. Frowning in frustration, he released his ironclad hold on his Reiatsu and sent them all to their knees, gasping and retching. Naruto held out a hand and, an instant later, spikes of ice shot up from the ground and skewered each of the root ninja. Letting his arm drop back to his side, Naruto frowned and lifted narrowed eyes to glare at the calm form of the man known as Danzo, who had instigated the battle that raged around them. End of the line, he said, blue eyes dead and calm. For you, yes, Danzo answered, slowly undoing the bandages around his shoulder. Beneath them was a perfect right arm, marred only by the myriad of blazing Sharingan eyes, each of which spun lazily. Naruto felt his blood run cold. You, he whispered harshly. You monster. Danzo scoffed, you and those before you, you're all too soft. You can't do what needs to be done in order to lead this land properly. Get off your high horse. Naruto yelled back, war won't solve anything. All it'll do is destroy the world and the peace we've fought so hard to protect. And Konoha suffers for it. Danzo roared, we could be so much greater. We could conquer all of the elemental countries, sweep in and crush the opposition effortlessly. But you, you're satisfied with oaths of fealty. This peace of yours won't last. As long as there are people willing to protect it, Naruto roared, this peace will never die. He vanished and when he reappeared, he had speared Danzo through the stomach. There was a moment of pause, then Danzo melted away and a gash appeared on Naruto's arm. There was the flutter of clothing and Naruto pushed the pain of the cut on his arm away as he dodged the attack from behind. That's not possible, Naruto said, glaring at Danzo. I killed you, I felt my sword connect with solid flesh and blood, and clones do not just melt away like that. How can you be Hokage and yet know so little? Danzo crowed, he leapt forward, holding a kunai in one hand. Naruto vanished and reappeared behind him. As he swung down, Danzo spun and stabbed at Naruto's gut. Both blows connected, but Danzo melted away again, leaving Naruto with a very real and bleeding wound. Naruto looked up, one arm wrapped around his injury, as Danzo appeared again, sending blades of compressed air at him. Naruto lifted a single hand and held it out in front of him, as though to block the blades. He spoke a single word, Danku, and a translucent wall erupted in front of him, blocking the attack. Naruto's hand glowed green for a second, then he stood, his wound closed, and stared down his foe. He swung his sword with a cry of, Guncho Sarara, and sent a pack of sharpened icicles at Danzo, who leapt over them. Naruto vanished, then reappeared behind Danzo and swung down again, calling, Natagiri. The attack landed, and, once again, Danzo melted away into nothingness. He appeared behind Naruto, who ducked under another swing and used a quick burst of Shunpo to put distance between them. Both landed deftly on their feet and Naruto noticed, for the first time, that three of the eyes on Danzo's arm had closed. Sheathing Hyo Rin Maru, Naruto slapped his hands together as though praying and slammed them to the ground. A large ceiling array bloomed beneath his palms and, in an instant, the two combatants were standing on the water at the valley of the end. Danzo looked around dazedly, surprise lit across his features. Naruto slapped his hands together again, brethren in arms withdrawing for the distance of eight sun and standing still. Blue bolt, white bolt, black bolt, red bolt, sinking into the ocean, together seeking redemption. He made several gestures with his hands and a wall of interlocking pillars appeared between them, reaching to the height of the statues nearby, Ryabi no Juman. Gate of the dragon tail he made more gestures in another structure, like a black and white watermill, appeared to Danzo's right, Koko no Juman. Gate of the tiger fang yet even more gestures and a third structure fizzled into existence, a pattern of interlocked hexagons, to Danzo's left, Kikai no Juman. Gate of the turtle shell above Danzo, a large structure not unlike a red lampshade slowly knitted itself together to the command of, Hoyoku no Juman. 
gate of the phoenix wings as this last structure fell into place, a translucent, box-shaped black barrier came into existence, its boundaries defined by the four structures, Shiji no Seimen. Gate of the Four Beasts Danzo hurled several attacks at the barrier, but, no matter what he did, the barrier seemed unscathed. Namikaze, he howled, what sorcery is this? Naruto did not answer and, with a flicker of Shunpo, reappeared at the Koko no Juman. He held up a hand, fingers stretched outwards, embraced it with his other arm, grasping his right arm just below the wrist. A ball of blue energy gathered there is a dense orange aura lit up around him, the orb growing steadily in size. Finally, when it had reached the size of a large basketball, the aura around Naruto vanished and the Koko no Juman pulled inwards, revealing an opening in the barrier. Naruto released the orb and it shot forwards at incredible speed, Ryujin no Shokyoku no Kan. Dragon gods incinerating flames the moment the orb passed the opening, it closed, snapping shut. A second later, there was an explosion and the barrier cracked from the pressure as brilliant blue flames filled it to the brim. There was a dull roar as the water that had been captured inside evaporated en masse and shrouded everything within in steam, but Naruto was sure that nothing could have survived such a powerful technique. He made a gesture with his hands and the barrier faded into nothingness. He had only a split second to rest before something sharp and metallic dug into his stomach for the second time that day. Danzo stood in front of him, left hand grasping the kanai impaling Naruto, and his right arm missing in a way that suggested it had been purposefully amputated rather than burned off. You've been a thorn in my side, Danzo breathed, for far too long, Namikaze. Naruto reached out and grabbed Danzo's burned arm, grunting, this is gonna be rather unconventional, but it should work. Reiatsu flared around him, glowing orange. Ito Kaso, single blade cremation, a large pillar of flame erupted, the lake sizzling as the water evaporated rapidly, and stretched towards the sky, shaped rather like the tip of a katana. Moments later, it was over, and Naruto and Danzo stood at the center of the blaze, Naruto panting and Danzo covered with angry, blistering burns. Danzo stumbled backwards and collapsed onto the shore, screaming as the dirt and rocks dug into his burned back. Naruto observed this with amazement, it was incredible that Danzo was still alive, let alone conscious, but he chalked it up to the fact that he had not used the Kido as it had been intended. Directing a bit of the Kyuubi's chakra into the new wound on his stomach, Naruto strode tiredly over to Danzo, freeing Hyo Rin Maru on the way. He leaned over Danzo's body and poised his sword to strike, this is the end, Danzo. Danzo reached up and pulled away the remains of his shirt, revealing a complex sealing array, if I, am to die, I'm taking you with me. Naruto swore and energy flared to life around him, then everything stopped for a second, just before Naruto vanished. Danzo's body was vaporized, but Naruto was already gone, and when he reappeared at the base of the Hokage Tower, everything stopped in mid-motion for a second, as though time had frozen. Time lurched back into motion when he stumbled and fell to his knees, clearly out of breath. What a way, Naruto panted, to test the technique. Hokage-sama, a ninja landed in front of Naruto, kneeling submissively. The situation is under control, Hokage-sama. Danzo is dead, Naruto told the ninja. What about Root? The ninja jerked at the news, but paused only a moment before answering, Root is currently being apprehended, Hokage-sama. Casualties are at a minimal and Root members are being repelled and captured. Hokage-sama, the council requests your presence. Naruto took in a deep breath, then let it out as a sigh. He stood in, a moment later, so did the ninja in front of him, all right. Let's get going, the clean up for this whole mess is going to be a nightmare. Naruto looked up at the bright, sunlit sky, and could not help but smile. Thanks for watching, the next part will be out soon.